All right. All right. Well, let's get started. We'll kick things off. So hello again, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Kristen. I'm the event specialist here at Encircle. So today's webinar will cover topics such as understanding the different estimating systems and challenges, some practical tools and techniques, and the importance of accurate documentation. This webinar is eligible for four IICRC continuing education uh, credits. So this isn't an Encircle training. However, if you are looking for support, you can always reach out to us at success at encircleapp.com. So without further ado, I will pass it over to you, Chris. Awesome. Thank you, guys. And thanks for, for joining this afternoon for the East Coasters. It's morning for the West Coasters. Um, this is going to be a good one. This is one that we've been working on for, for a while and then put it into play here. Uh, today, we're going to go through the agenda. We have a break this time. Uh, you guys have asked for, because they're so long, a uh, 15-minute break to catch up on email and bio breaks and so we're going to go through, we're going to go with the estimating struggle today. Uh, we'll go and look at the five estimating systems uh, that are used that are around the, the restoration and insurance space. We're going to talk about buttonology versus estimating. And this is based on some experience I had back in uh, 2009 uh, that became very real. And then we're going to go through the estimating trap. Some of the businesses that you are running may be experiencing some of this. Uh, we'll talk, there was a lot of questions about programs versus non-programs that came in, so we put this section in, and then we'll jump into a QA and a and a break uh, at that point. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go through and take a look at some of the unit pricing risks. That's one of the more common systems that you're looking at, and some of the more problems, or some of the uh, more identifiable problems come out of there. We're going to talk about tools of the trade. This has been a discussion that's gone on for years. Uh, what is tools of the trade? Should it be included in your price? Should it not be? Uh, we're going to look at parts of an estimating system more from a high level than, than the details of what you need to start putting in if you're writing an estimate, uh, how you would sort of support that estimate. And it comes in from a little bit more of a legal perspective there. And then we get into documentation to win. So if I was me building a file uh, as an expert, here's what I would put into it. And here's how I would document it so that you guys can get out uh, without getting a lot of scars, and then why you should be focused on being a profitable restorer. And then what we're going to do is we're going to close it out, and we're going to jump into a, probably a 45-minute Q&A at the end. If you guys have questions along the way, ask in the uh, the question box, and then the team's going to pull those up, and then we'll when we stop for question breaks along the way, uh, we'll try to get to them. And then if we don't get to them, we'll get to them at the end of this session. So we've got the, uh, the estimating struggle, and... <sighs> This is something that that is, you're in the game of restoration. So you get in to restoration because you enjoy helping people. You're cut from a different cloth than the other trades. There's easier ways to make money than to do restoration. If you were doing drywall or plumbing, that's an easier way to make money than being a restorer. But being a restorer, it becomes part of who you are. It's part of your identity. Uh, you get up at two in the morning because you want to help people. So it's not a lot different than being a firefighter, a police officer, a paramedic, a doctor. You're out there, you're a helper, that's your goal. Now, in order to continue your mission of helping people, this is a for-profit business. Uh, sometimes it doesn't feel that way, but you're serving customers. You're not out serving the public. You're out serving customers. Your business has to be profitable and you need your cash reserves. You need to be able to grow profits. Uh, you need to be able to reinvest in your business, in your talent, in your equipment, in your facilities, in order to continue to serve that customer and that community. And so when we look at it, we try to figure out, well, if we're running this business and we're generating these profits, what are we doing it for? And sometimes we lose sight that it's mostly to help those around us, your family, you're, they're making sacrifices for you to be doing this business, and your employees' families are making sacrifices so that you can help people. We sometimes lose focus, focus of that because we're just there to help, but there's a little bit of a sacrifice that we make that we need to get paid for and need to be compensated for. Now, I put this together because this was something that came from a discussion I had about helping people in their time of need. And unlike firefighting, these costs are people that are incurring a cost because you're coming to help them. So from your perspective, you've got your business and Anytime that you're dealing with somebody, you're protecting their investment. Effectively, when you show up after a loss has happened, 
they're now at a detriment. They've lost money. Uh, they're in a position where they weren't before, and you're putting your services back in to help them and their investment. And other trades have it easier than you do because other trades it is actually looked at as an investment by the customer. They're investing in their property value. They're updating their kitchen and they're creating a reno and they're getting something that they've desired for a while. You don't have that opportunity. You're repairing something that happened yesterday or earlier today and they didn't expect that you were coming into the business. So what happens is you're running up against this insured who's in between you and that investment. And it's kind of interesting because they're not seeing you as an investment. They actually look at you and the insurance company looks at you and you're on the other side, which is like, hey, insurance company, without me, uh, you would be not able to serve your customer. They look at you as an expense. And this is the unfortunate truth is that for them, they're in the business of insuring property. For you, your business is an expense to them. And when you come into a loss, you're the savior for the insured. You have to be there for that customer. They're having the worst day of their life. You're the savior during the rebuild. You're probably the inconvenience and you're a nuisance. And that's the, the life cycle of a, of a job or a claim when you're involved in it. Now, here's what's interesting. Initially, everybody's happy with you. You showed up during the emergency. As time moves on, it's harder to get paid. And then as time moves on in the rebuild, it gets more difficult to keep that customer happy. But because you're an expense to the insurance company, what they do is they invest in all of these people to effectively ensure that their investments are fine and that they're not paying too much money to that expense that they owe. So they look at those other players as investments in protecting their dollars. It's a weird concept because they don't add value. Now, what's when we start to look at this, we look at what is the insurance company doing and they're selling a peace of mind contract. So if we boil this whole thing down, they're selling peace of mind to the insured, which is saying if something bad happens to you, we're going to respond. We're going to provide the dollars that you need to be able to get yourself back to whatever the terms of the contract are. And at the end of the day, we're going to make sure that we have the right professionals there to help you. If you want to look at it, kind of think that you're outside that financial fortress and you're not allowed in unless someone opens the gate for you to collect your money and then you can leave. Reviewers, lawyers, consultants, TPAs, they're all on that side of the, the wall. They're holding the wall for the insurance carrier and they kind of have to. The insurance carrier is a financial transaction, a financial transaction only. They are there to collect premium. They invest that premium and then they pay out on losses and it's a numbers game. It's basically they're hedging bets against the weather, they're hedging bets against the losses and they have a good book of data to make those, those bets. You struggle because you're on the outside. And so this can be emotionally draining. I'm one of those people that gets their emotions on the sleeves. And when I'm trying to get paid from the financial fortress and I'm running into resistance, I get frustrated. Now I'm really good at submitting a good estimate and I'm really good at when the fight goes legal. I'm not good at that in-between negotiation where everyone wants to nickel and dime. That's where I get emotionally drained. Uh, so I have people that would do that for me. But if you're the person that gets drained from writing the estimate, but you're okay negotiating it, that's where you got to pick your positions. And what's interesting here is that you're feeling like you're doing something wrong every time that you're submitting an estimate and someone's criticizing you. It gets to you personally. And if it and if you're the right personality that isn't affected that way, you're head and shoulders above a lot of people. In this industry, it's hard because you're sacrificing your time from your family to go out and write those estimates. And the insurance company is is there and, and while you're a function of the industry or you're a function of that job, you're still an, an expense to the file. That for you should, uh, sorry, let me let me rethink, Morgan was my thought there. Being able to think about how you're gonna go forward in your position as an estimator, you have to change your perspective. You're doing the right thing. You're charging the money for the company. You have to take care of your business. You have to take care of your staff. You have to take care of your customer and one of the things that you need to do is work with the insurance carrier to make sure that you get all that together. That can be emotionally burdensome. That can make your business feel that stress. And if you feel that stress, sometimes you do those unnatural behaviors. 
long time ago, or maybe not that long, but for some of you, but a long time ago, I started in this industry. And for about 17 years, I've been working in restoration, uh, but focused on pricing. And so I actually had a really unique path that got me some of this experience. Uh, back when I started, and, and a little less, a uh, little bit more hair and, and not a beard, um, I took psychology, marketing, and I was part of a marketing competition, an international marketing competition uh, in university. And what I became obsessed with was pricing and understanding how price affected market. In 2007, my role within this industry, I got to do a lot of that. And I got some technical training and I started thinking about the technical courses as a path to become really proficient in this business. And any other business, if you're technically savvy uh, and you understand the mechanics of the business, you'll make money. What's interesting here is that I started drinking through a fire hose. I took the water damage courses, fire damage courses, and I had no idea how to take all that obscure knowledge and compress it into how to make money in this business. Uh, time passed though, and I started to run larger businesses. So I got some more experience. I got to work with some different companies and I became Canada's only independent Xactimate trainer. And for me, it was clicking around that time that in 2011, uh, I started to really understand profitability. Actually, it started in about 2008, 2009. And I started to learn systems that would allow you to absolutely get the benefits of the estimating system, but it came with a lot of hard, uh, hard lessons that came through it. In 2013, I was asked to be the head uh, of the RCOC's uh, estimating uh, uh, consultant. The RCOC was the Restoration Consultants uh, or Restoration Contractors Organization of Canada. When I did that, I represented 85%. We had to fix the pricing in Canada because coast to coast, prices were all messed up. And so we worked with an accounting firm called Deloitte. We, I was the only outside consultant and we broke down every price list from one coast to the other coast and we got pricing uh, changes made and we were able to identify real problems in the systems that we were using for the pricing. I later moved on to the RIA and I did some advocacy with them uh, in the estimating thing. But what happened is in 2014, 13, uh, I started to work in the business and really focus on helping other contractors get really profitable. But it was 2011 that I ended up meeting this guy, Ken Tucker, and I re-met him. And if you guys don't know Ken Tucker, he's one of Phil Rosebrook's old business mentors. Uh, he was the president of DKI Canada. What happened here changed my life. Ken came in and said, hey, Chris, you always use these words like, I always do this. I'll never do that. I'll never reduce an invoice. He said, you're talking like an employee, not like an owner. You need to change your perspective. I would recommend you go run a business for a while and learn what it feels like to be an owner because then you'll be a much better consultant because right now you sound like a disgruntled employee. And that advice from a really good friend of mine uh, changed my career. So in uh, 2011, I went from, from a hero that was doing estimating and helping other businesses get really profitable. And I ended up running a company. Um, one of our clients became uh, ill. He had a problem, his business was in trouble. And so what happened is we started with their business and we started making money. So the first year they didn't make anything. The second year I got in the business and we went and we turned 14% net profit. They thought everything was going really well. The next year we went in and we actually started working through and we started really pushing the numbers. And what happened here is we grew the, the numbers to 18% on our, on our next year. And I was like, man, everything we're doing is working. Everything couldn't be any better. The year after I went into the business and I was a partner and he got sick, his heart valve broke. And when his heart valve broke, I lost my details guy. What happened is all the systems that we had put in place had started to fail. And so we were losing money, we were bleeding cash. And when we broke it down, it was operations and estimating. And in 2000, um 15 we ended up going to the bank and we said hey we we're going to do a really good year my partner passed away and when he passed away he left the business in in pretty rough shape we had a two percent profit that year if we would have had his life insurance in the business we would have had about a 20 percent profit um because of that we didn't get that and i had to sit there and really figure out what are we going to do 
you know, I had lost all my claims adjusters or uh, we had three of the top claims adjusters that were 20 year career people. They all quit their company. We got suspended. Everything that could go wrong in that two year period did. But the one thing that we knew is that we could go back and rebuild the estimating systems, operations, and we could put it all together. I went to the bank and I said to them, hey, our next year is going to be just a monster year. And they're like, okay, but you haven't had two good years in a row. Um, you're not looking very sh sharp. And I said, you know what? We're going to grow the business. Not only are we going to grow the business, we're going to put the systems in place and we're going to crank our profit. And we're going to crank it to 29%. And, then, and I got laughed at by the accountant. The accountant told me that if you if you thought you were doing that, don't go meet with the bank. Don't even tell them because they're going to laugh at you. We all know who's in town. We all know what they're doing. Uh, your profitability is going to be a problem. That year, we actually turned a 33% profit. And uh, because my partner had passed away and his wife was there, we actually sold the business um, or, or closed the business down. Nobody wanted to run it because uh, the team that was originally there wasn't there. In 2016, I joined in Circle. So this is where the journey takes an interesting turn and where I'm going to bring it back for you guys is uh, when I worked with contractors in Canada, I saw a lot of things that happened in Canada. Now that's a different marketplace than the U S when I joined with Paul Donald, uh, we started to talk about the business and Ken introduced me to him said, Hey, this tech guy might know a thing or two about uh, restoration. You might want to take a look at what Paul's doing. Took a look at Paul's systems. He liked what I was doing. I liked what he was doing. And we were both focused on helping contractors get more profitable. So for the past nine years, that's all we've been doing is thinking about how restorers get more profitable, how their businesses are more aligned. Now, the experience I got with Encircle was interesting because it's a higher level experience than when you're working on individual estimates. When I was at Encircle, I started to see what the difference was when a company that was $500,000 ran and how did they look and operate when they were profitable? And how did they look when they weren't? What does a billion dollar organization look like when they're profitable? And what do they look like when they're not? And all of a sudden you start to see these trends that come out and you start to realize that everything that we knew back in 2009 and 2007 is relevant to today. And it actually is more relevant if you understand the systems and how they work and how estimating ties back into your business it's probably one of the more central things to making money. Now, for some of you that don't know, I left Encircle, uh, but Paul Donald and I are still really tight, and the guys at Encircle uh, were really close too. So I'm back here doing these boot camps uh, with Encircle, and it looks like I'm going to continue to do them, and we're now partnering. So um, that's the good news. But here's some other good news for you. It's not your fault if all of a sudden – this industry seemed to get really hard. The more information you pick up, the harder this job seems to get. A lot of people have been talking about this, this problem that we run into. And the journey led me to try to figure out why was it that we have more experience, you have more years of restoration, and then it seems to get harder to make money. You struggle in the environment to make money. And I got some answers for you in this, uh, this session because we actually broke it down and I worked with some psychologists to figure out what was happening in businesses and why they were, were feeling like the cards are stacked against you. Now, today we're going to uncover those opportunities. We're going to help you figure out some areas where some of these might apply to your business, some of them might not. But as a whole, what can you look at? Where can you focus and how can we get your, uh, your business moving? Now, before we do this, we do this on every one of our webinars. We do these polls. Uh, we customize these sessions to the people that are on the call. And so we'll tweak the, uh, the talking points a little bit on the fly. What is your role within the, uh, the company? Um, your choices are going to be, are you a project manager? Uh, are you a management ownership technician, an adjuster, or an insurance professional that's joining us? And I'm just going to see. Kristen, did you get the poll up? I can't see the poll on my side. There we go. So there's your question, guys. What is your role? You're part of management, you're a technician, uh, you're a project manager, estimator, you're an adjuster, an insurance professional. Oh, we've got a few of those guys on. Or uh, you're in a watch party with a bunch of people. All right. Oh, this is awesome, guys. Got a couple of technicians on. This is great. A few of you are in a watch party. That's cool. I. You know, when I first heard that people were doing that, I was like, man, thanks for trusting us. Uh, really appreciate 
you doing that and knowing that you're going to get some value out of these. Perfect. So we got a really heavy, uh, uh, heavy split here between management and ownership and project managers and estimators. And then we got a little bit of technician and a little bit of uh, insurance adjusters. And then some of you are doing watch parties. So that's a good split. We're going to talk about that. And then even for you insurance adjusters that are on or the insurance professionals, we're going to talk about this. That's going to relate to you and may help you understand some of the resistance of some of the frustration that the systems are creating you guys as well. All right, let's go. Uh, let's go back here. Kristen, can I get the, uh, the next poll put up is uh, what is the most profitable estimating system uh, that you guys are using? And now, uh, this one is a question. Now, there's one at the bottom, select all. I don't know. That wasn't supposed to get in there. Um, if you don't know, try to pick something else. But a few of you have already selected, uh, I don't know. You're trying to figure out what is the most profitable estimating method. Unit pricing, bid pricing, cost plus, t and uh, And then there's select all, I don't know. And a few of you just decide that's where we're going to go. Um, they're all profitable. Now, what's interesting here is is these are the more common systems that you're going to run into in restoration and it's awesome we're getting the results in uh, i'll give you guys a few more seconds because they're still pouring in we got about 60 percent participation and uh looks like right now i won't skew the results because we'll give it a, another couple seconds as the, lots of results are coming in what's wildly interesting is that when you start to look at pricing models or pro pricing methodologies uh it is really important that you understand how each of these systems are. So today we're gonna to go through and basically uh, walk through that. Now, here's here's the results. Uh, most of you guys answered that unit pricing was the most profitable. Bid pricing uh, got 13%, cost plus very low. T&M, 25%, and then a bunch of you said, yeah, I don't know, select them all. Um, really cool, guys, that's good. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold this one uh, for a bit. We're gonna come back to it and talk about it. And we got one more poll. And this is more just about profitability. How profitable is your restoration business? And so if you don't know this, this is we're talking about net profit, end of the year profits. If you don't know, don't answer, because I want to see if we can get a good data set here. Um, nobody's going to know. So it's an anonymous poll. If you feel like you did well or you feel like you did bad, nobody's going to know. If you didn't do, uh, do very well, you lost money, uh, put that in there. Uh, I lost money. I showed you my numbers. We had a couple stinker years, had some great years. Uh, let's see how, how we're doing. One of the interesting things is that it depends on your product mix, how your, your business is operating. If you hit a cat, you could have an artificial bump in your, your revenue and your net profit as well. But you know, a lot of factors come into play in, in trying to sustain profitability on a consistent basis. So we understand that. Now we've got, it uh, looks like we're pretty good. Uh, we can end the poll there. Some of you lost money, some broke even or or not quite so much. Uh, a large majority of you, if we take less than 10%, yet 10% is kind of the number that I always look at is if you're not at 10%, it's really much a struggle in your business. So 10% or below, we consider that not really making money. And, and that would account for just about 50% of you are there just shy of, uh, of making money. 31% said, hey, 10 to 15%. And 23% of you said, hey, we crushed it. Now, of those people that are crushing, if your company is mostly mitigation, it's a little easier to get there than if you're doing rebuild or full service. But that's uh, that's really good. So these are the uh, these are the results, and uh, and that's all right. You know, that's a good mix. A lot of you are sort of in that, you know, making some money, maybe not making some money uh, levels. So let's get started. And... Uh, Let's keep moving here. So there is the five estimating systems. Now, when we look at them, you got rate and material. Now that it's called sometimes time and material. You negotiate rate and you negotiate prices on materials. And it's just what you accrue uh, or incur on the job site that you're, you're then charging. So we negotiate the rates on materials, consumables, uh, hotels, airfares, expenses, what are we going to work on there? And we basically put that together and bill for what we we incur on the job. Unit pricing is the next one. Now, you could call it unit pricing and unit estimating. Now, there's a little bit of a difference, and we'll get into that. But unit estimating is traditionally, traditionally where you figure out 
how much where you would charge to hang a door and it's based on a, a assembly of labor materials and you put that in that's unit estimating today most of the time you're using a digital system you're probably not using a, a homemade created system if you're from australia and i know we get some aussies on here they're using a form where they do per, per room pricing that's a form of unit pricing it's it's a form of unit estimating where it's a price per room per square meter within a room uh, you also have bid pricing so bid pricing you're just submitting a lump sum and uh, it's it's also known yeah lump sum pricing bid pricing and then you've got cost plus not normally done in this industry uh, this is where the contractor pre-negotiates labor rates and then there's a margin or a, a markup put on top of materials and costs and everyone uh, takes shares a little bit more risk the insurance carrier shares risk and the uh, contractor shares some risk and then finally you have value pricing which you don't see a lot of here and that's where you decouple the costs from the price and you you sell the value whether it's perceived or real uh, when you deliver it now when you get into di degree of difficulty, the most difficult to run is gonna be your unit estimating and unit pricing. Then it's bid pricing. Value pricing is pretty easy. And then cost plus and rate materials, it's all an administrative game before you start and you get started and you, then you go into the, uh, um, the billing aspect, which is more administratively heavy. The interesting part about this is when you look at cost plus, this is where it becomes easy. And normally where you see this is really large projects. So the reason it's used on large projects, and there's an argument to be made that it could be used in insurance, is that the job fluctuates for 30 days. So after 30 days, your price of materials still might go way up. Well, I can't give you a hard number at the beginning. So a lot of government jobs, uh, highways, all of that is built on a cost plus basis. And that's why it's normally jobs that are longer term. Um, the builder will make less money in some cases, but they're guaranteed to make money. So they're not going to take a loss on here. The only thing they have to do is run the back end of the business more efficiently. But you kind of can do that because you know you have a, a billion dollar project or you got a, a hundred million dollar project or you got a ten million dollar project. You know that that's going to take a year and a half, two years to circulate. You know that you can assign administrative costs to the business based on that. Uh, on really large costs or really large projects or projects with a longer duration, you'll have that cost of inflation built in. So labor prices in year one are this, labor prices in year two are, are X plus the inflation rate or X plus 5%, something like that. That's how it works with cost plus. When we start to look at cost plus though, you should be familiar that a lot of the time you're bidding in government or you're doing with First Nations, or you're dealing with military, you're probably going to look at cost plus as one of the models. And sometimes their bidding uh, requirements will say, this is a cost plus program. You kind of need to know how to build that, that program out if you're going to do that. Um, the big thing is, it's all about the prep. And cost plus is all about understanding your numbers before you start and you put anything in. The challenge with, with this model is that you can put in your numbers and if you don't know what you're doing you can bleed your company dry as the project goes on so if you're if you make a mistake on your pricing uh you're going to live with that mistake for the pricing for a long time and usually there's a performance bond that has to be put in place uh but cost plus requires a lot of uh discipline a lot of strategy and it's one of the safest pricing models but it's also normally geared for high volume or really large projects the next one, and this one's where we start to get into this, is rate materials. It's a smaller job version of cost plus because you kind of understand what your costs are. The job window is, let's call it, you know, a month, uh, six months. You can run cost plus on those jobs and you can basically do that. Sorry, you can run rate material on those jobs. You can do that because you can negotiate all those rates. You have an understanding of what your materials uh, costs are going to be and you put that in. Now, the fundamental part here is a lot of restorers skim over building their price list. They take whatever they get from the unit pricing systems and they just roll it out. This system requires you to administratively be smart. You have to have a, a good knowledge of your numbers. You have to know what volumes you're running uh, to build a really good price list. And you have to think about this as kind of like calculating anything in your, in your life. If you were trying to figure out if you your kids should play soccer, you'd Think about the time commitment to there. Be like, well, that's like four hours a week. 
uh, it's going to be for 10 weeks. Okay. That's 40 hours of our time. Plus we're going to have to go to the park and play some soccer. Uh, we have the cost of the ball. We have cost of registration. When you look at it, a lot of the things we do in life is based on rate and material or time and material. We, we think about our investments that way. This is the foundation for everything you do in estimating. So if you don't understand this, chances are all the other systems aren't going to work for you. When we put it this way, this is how I would look at it. And rate materials are the foundation for everything you do. You can't come up with a value price unless you know what your hard costs are going to be. You can't come up with a bid price unless you know how you're going to get to that bid. Unit pricing has a whole bunch of assumptions built into it that if you don't know what it actually takes to get the job done, you're going to have a really hard time uh, getting that unit price right. Now, what we have is when you, we look at our price sheet, when you look at unit pricing, you've got all these things that you're going to do. You're going to, what materials? Are you supplying the material? So are you supplying sheets of plywood? Uh, are you supplying antimicrobial? What's the cost on those materials, uh, building materials? Maybe you have like um, window uh, sheathing for for doing um, um, lockup on a building. You got accommodations and meals. How are you? How are you doing that? Do workers share a room? Do ever does everyone get their own room? Uh, vehicles and flights. What are we doing for costs? What do we do for truck rentals? Is it a cost plus a margin? Are we charging per day for company vehicles? Same thing with labor rate, consumables, and equipment. So when you start to get into this, you basically take all that and you create these price lists out. And you say, well, in, the, in my, my price sheet, we have all the things that we might do. We, we have our equipment rentals. We rent an extension cord and it's $10. We rent a broom to you and it's $5. Or maybe we sell the broom to you at $30. However you come up with this pricing scheme, that's what you would base all of your estimating on your entire business on is how did you come up with your rate materials for what a job requires. Now, the one thing you might add in there as well is sub trade and vendors. And a big thing that comes down to it is it doesn't matter what category you're in. Every job you're going to look at, you're going to look at things like the type of labor, the type of material that's going to help build your list. What's the rate or the price that you're going to charge for that that service. So if I'm going to send a technician regular hours, it's X. After hours, it's Y. And then holidays and stats and triple time, it's affected on, on this part. You have all that laid out. So everybody knows that when something's triggered, something else is going to get charged. We look at quality. Uh, what are the quality of the things we're using? What are the sizes? Uh, what is the quantity? How many units? And then what is the efficiency uh, and production downtime? So you might have a, a, a job where it's a, let's say it's a four month job, it's remote. So it's not at a place of your normal business. You have temporary workers that are staying in accommodations. They can only work based on this jurisdiction. They can only work six days of the week and they need a seventh day off. If they can only work six and they get seven, who's paying for that hotel for that seventh day? When do we travel people in and out of site? Is it billable or do we have to eat it as a cost? If we eat it as a cost, have we worked it into our pricing? All of this becomes a really complex matrix of pricing that you have to sit down and really figure out before you get started. Here's when you would use it. So here's why you would use rate and material. Highly complex projects. Uh, if a project is really complex, how are you creating a budget of time and then charging it out based on an estimate. It's really hard to do. Uh, where you have unpredictable job costs, so you're dealing with stuff that you're not familiar with what they cost, you probably would want to use rate material and then be like, anything that's not on my list is 25 or 40% markup or 30% margin or 40% margin. However you word your contract, you're going to say, on these costs, I don't know what they're going to cost. So whatever the cost is, I'll just charge you a uh, margin on top of that. When the client doesn't trust you, you would use rate and material. Hey, I will just charge for what you use. Don't take my opinion on a bid. Don't take my opinion on a unit price. I will just charge you for, for what we incur, and I'll show you the paperwork that we incurred it. And I would advise you that we put someone on so that they can watch us. And the, this is called a clerk of the works, but if you do it in a private setting, you might have an employee of their company come in and sign the paperwork as you go. If you have projects that are going to go on for a long time now, this is where it's is it a year? Is it six months? It depends what you define as long, but you have long duration projects that you're going to run. 
Then you got mitigation and emergencies. Why? There's a whole bunch of unknowns in there. There's a lot of decision making delays that happen. If you get into like bigger uh, job schools, um, small, small residential, small commercial, sorry, small commercial, large residential, you might use this as well. Where you have a vague or poorly defined scope. So if I'm dealing with somebody and I don't really understand what we're what we're dealing with, we're trying to figure out the scope. You're probably going to move into a rate material contract. Value pricing is interesting. You might not even be aware that you're a value buyer because if it's done right and you receive the value from this, I just got to fix my screen here. Even when you potentially didn't receive real value, you feel like you did. So you have a perceived value. Uh, most times you'll not receive, like there's no real value to it. It's a perceived value that you get from value pricing. It's peace of mind. Uh, it's status. It could be that you're paying for a brand promise. So uh, insurance is about brand promise that they will be there. You have no idea if they're going to be there, but you assume that they're going to be there. Brand promise is different than peace of mind. Brand promise is you get a sense that the brand represents who you are. The brand is going to be there for you. The brand is part of your, uh, it's your life. Um, if you were to look at it, Starbucks is a brand where there's a brand promise and it becomes part of what you are. Walking around with a Starbucks cup is a status symbol. So it's a little bit of everything that moves into there. Now, if you were to look at it, you get a cup at Starbucks, uh, you're paying for that status symbol. You're more sophisticated than someone who gets it from Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, the general, uh, the stores generally provide you the experience of more personalized service. If you were to look at this and compare it to like going to McDonald's, McDonald's has a board where there's a number. You're 364, 364. Yeah, that's my coffee. At Starbucks, they look for Chris and they're like, Chris, there's your cup. It's personalized. So you believe that there's more of a brand loyalty there. There's a personalization. That value goes up. It's really hard in restoration to associate your services with a brand. The reason why is value pricing comes in where it's a perceived value versus real value. When perception can be changed is when you put people that are like TPAs and adjusters who don't have anything to do with the, the purchase uh, or the experience of the product. They're only there to validate the numbers. And so that's a cost control the insurance carriers put in because perceived value, uh, the brand promise, doesn't necessarily resonate with the customer or with the adjuster. It does resonate with the customer. You're there on their worst day. You're there helping them get it through. When you submit a price, somebody who's not emotionally invested in that, that success will then come in and review it. The customer has to feel good about spending their money to spend more with you. So value pricing in insurance is not a really common uh, experience. Um, when you think about saving money, and that's where unit pricing comes in. I want that McDonald's coffee because it's still coffee. It's $1.50 for that coffee. We're not paying $4 for your coffee. As much as it's probably nice, comes in a nice cup, we can get the same thing over there. That's the mentality of the insurance industry because they're not buying the value that you're you're selling. Uh, 20 years ago, though, an adjuster would benefit or an adjuster contractor relationship would benefit from value pricing. Hey, this is a really crazy insured. The price is going to be higher. That was value pricing. And the adjuster would be like, yeah, if you can make that problem go away for me, I'll pay you a little bit more. The adjuster was tied to the value of the service you provided. You would see that if you... Uh, had a homeowner that was elderly and you're like, hey, this is going to be a little bit more handholding. We'll pay you for that time. So in the past, it was more pre relevant. Today, you might see it with more higher end adjusters, uh, people that are doing complex stuff. They may still reward you for value. They may just say, hey, build it into your rate sheet. If you're doing rate material, you get it a different way. You might not get it the same way we used to. When you start looking at restoration value pricing, uh, or or in, in the big scope of it, this is where you would start to look at what are your margins. And so t &M, you usually get a cost. Uh, you've got your overheads built in there. So let's, let's use the blue as our overheads. Uh, the red is our job cost, our cost of goods sold. If we use t &M, your profit could be the top part. If we use unit pricing, you can, the units are, are I'll get into it later, but the units 
could give you more efficiency. So you could build in more profit into a unit price. When you start to look at bid pricing, uh, bid pricing is interesting because bid pricing, you can factor in that that homeowner is going to be a lot harder to deal with. So you say, hey, I'm going to charge some more value. Uh, I'm not actually taking any more time. I'm just, for my headaches, it's worth more. You would also value this in a bid. Is it, Do you take on more risk? Are you dealing with hazardous or uh, or wild conditions that are generating more risk to your business? Uh, is the degree of difficulty higher? Are you a business that is doing something that most other restorers can't do? You're probably going to bid it at a higher number. Value pricing has nothing to do with your costs. I'm going to charge you $1,500 to repair the carpet because it's going to cost you $10,000 to replace it. Would you like me to fix it for $1,500? I will be there for a half hour. That is where you uncouple uh, the cost to, to the business, uh, to the price of your product, and your business thrives based on that, that value pricing. So I've done jobs where you're out repairing carpet, wax on carpet, pet damage, charging four, five, six, seven times, whatever I would normally charge. It's more the value. They're like, oh, this doesn't do it. We're going to replace the carpet. Perfect. How much does the carpet cost to replace? 10 grand. I could fix this for two. I'll be there for an hour. Is my value two grand? The perceived value to them is 10,000 versus two. So that's how value pricing can work in some scenarios in restoration. The question then is, when is value pricing called gouging and when when does it become gouging now this is a sensitive discussion because you've got a really dynamic environment when you start to talk about value pricing one person and you'll see this i would never pay five dollars for a starbucks coffee that person doesn't value the perceived value of that price so it becomes a, a thing about perception an adjuster might review an, an invoice that you gave somebody and to go $1,500 to fix the carpet, I could have done it for $200. That's a ripoff. It wasn't to that homeowner because their other option was replacement. So it's perceived value is about the person and what do they believe they got out of value. It has nothing to do with cost. The problem is, is as an adjuster, they're in a difficult but not impossible position. They have to review pricing on a regular basis. So they get familiar with pricing Value pricing doesn't work when people know the cost of doing something uh, because then they might just come back and be like, well, Starbucks charges 10 cents for a coffee or they make it for 10 cents. So I should charge $5, but there's a perception that coffee costs more to make. Once you know what they, their cost is, you probably become less inclined to pay it. And that's what the adjusters are and the reviewers. They're experts in cost analysis, even if they don't properly know everything they're doing on it they start to see numbers and they start to see trends and go, hey, I think that's too much. It feels like gouging. Um, but at the end of the day, it's the perception. So if you sell to the public and someone's good with paying it, value pricing can be whatever you want. Is it price gouging in insurance? It depends on how you do it. I'll give you a real world example. Um, I was an adjuster. I spent two years of my career adjusting, probably not even a full two years and not long enough to call myself an adjuster. But long enough that I got the experience of sitting in that chair. And so I had this job that, that my manager brought in. He said, Chris, he goes, this church flooded. Um, they got hit with this water that entered the building. Uh, it's pretty simple, pretty straightforward. They installed equipment. Uh, they went in there Wednesday night before Good Friday. And the church has a, a huge revenue draw on that weekend, right? Easter weekend. Um, the, the restoration company came in. They set up all the equipment. They started drawing. They'd come back, they'd take all the equipment out for the service, and then they put all the equipment back in after, and they did this all weekend long. And admittedly, they did pretty amazing service, but we need you to cut the price because the invoice showed up and it's too much. And so the charges were about 25% higher on equipment, about 100% higher on labor. So at the time, I think labor rates were $50, it was $100. Uh, then there was overtime rates, so it was much higher than what they had seen. I looked at the paperwork and the contractor had a contract that you could see they had value pricing, but they did it as a unit or like a T&M uh, price. They had the T&M list. They gave the, the customer a, a price. They said, hey, we'll do it for $20,000 and then your whole weekend you can run. And so they came back with normalized rates that they said, these are my normal rates. They 
put it into a value bid and they gave it to the church and said, hey, we don't know if your insurance company will pay for this. So here's the risk. We'll charge you $20,000 and we'll take care of you all weekend long. Um, you don't have to worry. The quote will never go up. The price is the price. And at the end of the day, we'll guarantee that we will dry your building out and we'll take care of you. The perception and the reality is you probably could have got it for a lot less. However, they sold the value to the church that they were there the whole weekend with them. And this was going to be a great weekend. Don't worry about your, your Easter weekend. They sold the value and the priest ended up going in and signed the contract and then submitted it a little while later. What, happened is the insurance company our our team reviewed the file and went we could have got that for a lot less here's the problem is when they started to look at it the contract was signed the adjuster maybe was right it was higher than normal rates uh, but to the customer you're either a saint or a savior when you do that for them and then the adjuster you're on the wrong side of the stick at the end of it so when we started looking at the numbers saying hey like these numbers just don't make sense. All of a sudden, you're looking, are we in legal trouble? Does the pricing, does the value pricing become a legal issue for that contractor? And the way they did it was perfect. It was like, no, that's a that's a binding contract. They have a binding contract with the church. So now the insurance company's argument has nothing to do with the contractor. It has everything to do with the church. And when we started to talk to the uh, father, uh, it was interesting. In this specific case, when we met with him, we just said, hey, like, we're trying to understand this invoice is pretty high. And he's like, oh, the value was amazing. They came in, uh, they took care of us. They were super passionate about helping us at, the, at our time of need. And I was able to focus on all my services. I didn't have to worry about water damage. So right there, you knew the perceived value was really high. And as you start to work through, it's like, yeah, they, they had a contract. They did their job. They reduced severity. It just wasn't as reduced as maybe someone else could have got. Um, and what was interesting is as this file went up for review, the senior managers were like, yeah, it's contractually, it's it's a good contract. It's a value price. Um, but the psychology played all the, all the factors in there. So the psychology came in and basically uh, created this scenario where, where the priest made the decision, felt so impassioned about the decision that he made that, you know, as an insurance company, it was just easier to pay it and keep the business. Next one you get is you get lump sum or bid pricing. Um, this is one where you get a little bit more familiar. You're starting to move in where you're submitting bids. Now, this is more common. This used to be more common in the marketplace. Bid pricing is a way that is an all-inclusive of the scope. So it gives you the opportunity to, to factor in fudge factors, bad customers, all those things that are not necessarily tied to the, the production rate, but it's tied to the inconvenience rate or it's tied to the skill rate. And so you provide a bid. This is very close to value pricing where you decouple it from cost. With bid pricing, you're typically coupled to the cost and you're like, well, our costs on this job are 100 grand. We want to make 50%, so we need to charge 200,000. And then you're like, wow, but we're on bid against this other company, so maybe we build 190,000. You start to factor in what your costs are and how much you need to make. And usually you have a bottom line, like what is your overheads? And so you, you start running your bid price that way. Now, when you bid, bidding is kind of like gambling. You're controlling the odds in this gamble though. You get to view the site, you get to play against the house or you get to play against other, other players. When you start to look at it this way, uh, you look at how do you game the estimate? You get to call subtrades in and get them to come in and tell you their opinion. I think this is what we're going to be in for plumbing. I think this is where we're going to be in. And you can break it down where you share some risk amongst some of your trades as you come in and build this bid. You don't have to do it blind. The customer is part of that discussion. You get to find out what their position is. How are they going to muck up your game when you're putting in your bid? And finally, you get to choose whether you bid or you fold, you might not want the job. It's too too technical for you. It's a bad customer. It's a bad adjuster. It's a bad insurance company. Uh, they don't pay. If you are bidding, are you factoring in that they don't pay? All of that is part of the game when you submit. I actually like bids because you're going to get a price at the beginning. It's agreed upon, and you're bidding against uh, other contractors. Uh, if you do this really well, 
you know what your your opponents are doing and if you get into a um, an environment where you have really good project managers or estimators that you bid against everybody makes money when they win nobody's that that bottom and out uh contractor now what happens is when you get into this um 2010 i had an amazing project like you want to understand how bids work it is a psychology game in a lot of cases um i had an old school project manager and and he owned some property management relationships so he said i want to take you out and and we're going to go and take a look at this uh uh this project and and you need to come in and and work with me on this and as we were walking in he said listen i need you to to, to not say anything when i ask you if it's right you just nod your head and agree and if i if i say something's a negative and i look to you for an opinion you just shake your head and disagree with it and he said we should be good so as we walked we're guiding this adjuster around now we showed up in it was like a chevy ht some kind of like little like mini it almost like station wagon like a little pt cruiser type of car just imagine that's what two guys roll in is this pt cruiser type of uh car and so we show up we get out of the pt cruiser and he's got a big smile on he's wearing a suit we're walking through and as we walk the site He's guiding the adjuster around and he's talking to the other two contractors uh, on the on the job site. And as we walk through, he's looking around at concrete. He's creating, oh, you know, water impacts concrete in different ways. And it can get really complex on these high rise buildings. And, and as we're walking through all these plaster walls, these these are, are really difficult plaster walls that we're going to have to address. And he turned to me and he says, are you seeing all this work? And I nodded. And then we started walking around. And he said, well, the degree of difficulty for, for pulling resources to this job are really tough. And as we started to go, I, I nodded again. And, and then we got to an area. And finally, he said in the parking lot, he's like, did you see the parking lot here? And everyone's watching him. He's like, there's not enough, uh, not enough space for all the resources you need for this building. That's going to add time to this job. And he goes, do you think I missed anything? And I went, no, no, I think that's, that's right. We get in the truck. He goes, what do you think? said so honestly i thought you were a little high there he goes yeah me too he goes i absolutely know we're gonna we're gonna have a good relationship with this project or with the, the property manager he goes the other two guys have no idea what they're doing so he was like i just started to talk about how big this job is they're gonna bid really high we're gonna win the bid uh, don't worry about it he goes that's what happens when they send rookie uh, estimators to a job site he was totally psychology taking the psychology of the of the walkthrough and setting the adjuster's expectations for a high price, he set their expectations for a high price. He talked it up. He used me as a prop, and he's laughing the whole way back to the office. And sure enough, when the bids came in, we were a couple hundred thousand dollars lower than them, but our margins were really tight. Everybody on the job site had set the expectation that the job was really complex. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away. But he he taught me a bunch of ways that we could sell obscure services to property management companies and the stuff we did was pretty exciting that one walkthrough i was like okay i know exactly what he did and why he did it uh but he didn't tell tell me before we went in and it was an interesting way to do it because what you happen to do is you're combining everything in there he was doing a tally in his head what was rate materials what was unit price what was the value that he was going to serve this this property manager and adjuster uh, what was the risk of underpricing or overpricing it? And was the increased margin tied to that risk? He basically had overlaid his thoughts and opinions onto others that they were going risk, 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 risk. And he's going experience. I'm, I'm going to deal with this risk experience. Yes. All the resources wouldn't fit in the parking lot, but they do. If you stage the job in certain uh, processes, only experience would give him that and so that's how he was he was working now one of the one of the problems is with bid it's a reverse auction the lowest bid wins so when you're in a competitive landscape where you're competing against other contractors that, who are willing to do the work for less sometimes you're going to get those people that are are not as skilled and they sink the entire auction they they underbid the other thing that you need to watch out for is what they call a false auction this is where the bidder is not a contractor. They are a consultant and they're bidding against you. You're the only one with real money on the table. A consultant is bidding against you on a bid um, process. They're not in the game. They have no stake. They have no opportunity to lose money. 
they're literally setting a price saying, oh, it's a hundred thousand dollars. And you're like, no, I think it's like 150. You're the only one with real money on the table. So when you get into these high risk situations and you're bidding against somebody who is not prepared to do the work, be very careful that you're in a false auction. You're actually bidding against yourself and you're the only one that has the opportunity to lose something. No one else has any opportunity to lose. It doesn't happen as much. And, and let me know if it happens more for you guys. Uh, I, I haven't seen that trend happening as much these days. Normally, they're saying, hey, I think your, your unit pricing is wrong. But a pure bid where you're submitting a number uh, in an envelope or, or you're submitting a number by, by a deadline, normally that's with contractors. There was a period of time, though, when we were seeing it against consultants who were never going to put their numbers, like they're never going to do the work. But they're telling you what the price should be or they're telling the insurance company what the price should be. Here's why I would use it. If there's limited or no review process after the job, because when you submit the bid, there is no reviews that need to come. So I'm going to tell you what the price of the job is based on the fact that I have a pretty known set of, of uh, scope of work that I can deliver on. I don't need to be reviewed at the end. If you agree to this price, I'm going to do the work at that price. If there's ads add-ons to the scope where you're going to give you a change order, that's a great way to bid most jobs. That's the old way to do it. I think it was the fair way to do it. Everyone knows the price going in, but it delays the claims process. It delays the the the, the job cycle. Uh, if you know the scope of work, it works really well. If it's an unknown scope of work, not so good. I wouldn't do this in uh, unknown scope of work. Uh, you're battling contractors. So if you're battling people that are experienced, Great. If you're battling people that are inexperienced, that's still great because they may underbid and lose their business. Uh, they may damage their financial portfolio, portfolio for the year. If you know what you're doing and you lose, that's okay too. You don't want to be the contractor who wins 95% of all their estimates. You're literally underbidding the entire market if you're doing that. Um, and then you get paid for the soft thing. So if you all show up to a job site and that customer is super demanding, chances are, everyone's going to raise their price to deal with that that customer or that adjuster or that insurance company. But you have to use caution. Bid pricing, there's no checks and balances in a bid. You are going to go in there. It's like taking your dad's car out for the first time when no one's looking and you juice it a little hard and you, you, you lose control. Same thing happens in bids. These have to be really critical decisions that are made buy a team, man, usually it's the management team reviews the bid, what's our potential exposure, what can we lose, how much can we make, why are we doing it this way, a uh, whole bunch of questions get asked. The issue with bids is that sometimes that scope of change, that scope for the contract is really vague, and all of a sudden you get into a scope discussion um, where you're legally obligated to execute a bad scope of work, and it can tie you up and, and really damage you. I've seen project managers who talk about their $5 million job that they wrote, but they literally made no money on it or they lost money. We had, we, I had one project manager. He wanted to tell me all day long about the $5 million job he did. When I looked at the job, he lost 12%. It was like the worst job you could do. We made no money. We didn't even cover overheads. So when you look at these jobs, don't get sucked into the big number. You still need to hit the profit. Everything should be profit driven. Now, it's one of the biggest lures is that the big game, being able to play the big numbers, is an ego boost. Just watch that you're not putting your business at risk. Uh, there was a contractor that took a job in an older building, and it was an asbestos job, and the scope of work was pretty clear. They bid the job at a million dollars. The problem was, it was the, the, the rules around the bid was that it was a really tight uh, set of rules that you had to execute the contract. Um, when they were in there, the other companies bid 2.2 million and 2.4 million. The actual cost of the job was 1.8 million when they had to go in there. That contractor bid a million dollars, cost him 1.8 to finish the job. So he, 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 he turned his business upside down and eventually that's what broke the business. He had to go bankrupt. That will happen in bids. And so you have to understand it's easy to put a number in. You have to be able to execute on it. He maybe need the terms and conditions of cash flowing. He had no idea what his costs were going to be. So just be care careful when you do bidding. All right, we're, going to, we're coming up to a question uh, period here in a second, but we're going to go through the unit pricing. Unit pricing and estimating 
What do you see when you see this picture? If you look at it in a unit price, what do you see? Well, you see, and I'm gonna use the term unit pricing. You see a respirator, a Tyvek suit, um, latex gloves, although they should be nitrile gloves, um, rubber boots, not in the picture, knee pads, not in the picture, tape, not in the picture, but definitely not on his wrist. Um, that are unit prices. Those are consumables that have a price. You pull one off the shelf, that's a unit price. A unit estimate is how much spray is he gonna use? We don't know. We're gonna estimate the spray amount. Unit pricing and unit estimating are a nuanced difference, but you need to be aware of it. Unit pricing, I can tell you the price because I can set the price on a piece of equipment or I can set the price on a consumable because I know what the cost is. A unit estimate, I'm making a guess. I have no idea what it's actually gonna cost us until we get some experience either on that job or using past experience to say this is what I think we're going to get on this job. Now, if you were to look at the sprayer and the amount of spray, what is the inefficiencies of working in a restoration environment? How many feet can that, that person spray in that site? What's the temperature? What's the dehumidification going to do? Are we going to get a 10-minute dwell time or do we got to apply two or three applications to get 10 minutes of dwell time? Do you know, are you even thinking about dwell time on antimicrobial? Because if you aren't and you have a really hot, dry environment, your dwell time is going to be like maybe a minute, minute and a half, and then it's dry. Well, you need to keep wetting that surface five times. That's five antimicrobial, antimicrobial applications to do it right, and you've only charged for one. Your unit estimating is going to come into play here. Uh, you need to account for the practices that aren't there. How long does it take to don and off gear? Did the unit pricing of a computerized unit pricing system account for PPE changes in a hot environment, or is it normal working environment and that's what they've accounted for? How many square feet can the worker do? How many square feet does one gallon of product deliver? Um, how much product gets wasted because of the temperature? All of that you have to factor in. And so there's a whole bunch of things that we're looking at is like, what is the actual cost of the product? If you choose product A versus product B, What's the actual cost of the product? Those are the questions you would start to look at. And then when you start looking at the complexities, a simple unit price. So the simple one is a piece of equipment, a consumable. There's no variables there. It gets more difficult when you start to combine four or five components, so labor and material and a piece of equipment and efficiency to one task, like spraying antimicrobial. You have all those considerations. And now you go and say, okay, well, let's extract 100 feet of carpet, whole different set of circumstances and considerations that you have to apply. What's the factor working in there? That gets more difficult. Extremely difficult is when you start to combine multiple line items. And I saw restorers probably about three years ago. Oh, we should just do whole room pricing. That is insane. That is that you have one unit price spraying antimicrobial combined with extracting carpet combined with tearing out carpet combined with tearing out drywall and you're assuming you're going to get a really good production rate to come up with 10 or 15 dollars a square foot if any of those variables change on any of those items chances are you're going to be losing money faster so that's where it becomes really extremely difficult to do unit pricing funny enough this is the choice is from insurance companies is they love unit pricing because they think that they're getting a actual price it's unit estimating is actually what we're doing. Here's a demonstration of it in a rebuild scenario. If you were to, to go paint two coats and use a code that does it, now I'm not going to get into the buttonology of each system, but let's look at it this way. In that price, it says you get the labor to get organized. You get the labor and the vehicle to travel to the site. You get site prep, which includes supplies. Um, you've got material. You then have the equipment and supplies to do the job. You get the labor to paint, and then you watch it dry. You might not get paid to watch it dry. And then you paint again, and then you clean up, your, and you get your labor and supplies for cleaning up, and then you travel. And then when you get to the shop, you got to get the truck cleaned and organized. That is all included in that unit price. If the scope changes a little bit, and you go in in the first part, you're getting organized. And then instead of staying there and watching it dry, you clean up, 
and you leave and then you got to come back. Well, you got to get the truck organized. You got to travel. You got to go through all the steps. You've now doubled the scope of work. You doubled the orders of operations effectively. You ha What's the price of that? That has to be factored into a unit price. That's how unit prices are built. So if you haven't factored this in and said, oh, well, we're actually painting three times and we're going to come back three different days, that's a different price than, hey, we're going to come back and we're going to do it all in one, one visit. We're just going to do circulation through the house. Every unit price is built this way. And if you don't realize that you know, you have a difference in, in how you're going to execute the job, that unit price can be completely off the radar. Unit pricing is the most difficult method to price services. Arguably, you could say bid pricing is because you, you could use the unit pricing to come in there, but you need to control the conditions and you have to have predictability. Uh, you must uh, control all the variables. So you have to factor in um, everything that you're doing. If you look at factory unit pricing, to produce 42 cars per hour at a cost of $10,000 a car, we know our production rate. If we go on strike, if the car plant changes, if health and safety change, that cost either goes up or down. And so we don't really look at our unit pricing that way. And where you can tell is that we get into uh, conversations on Facebook that drives me nuts. What's the price for uh, in, in this unit pricing system? What's the price for paint? What's the price for demo? What are you doing? You have to look at your unit price to come up with it. And so you're, if, you, if you don't have the system pricing, Chances are you're trying to just use somebody else's number and put it into your job. It doesn't work very well most of the time. Unit pricing in manufacturing is probably the easiest way if you want to think about it this way. Your general overheads is your office. Everything inside of the plant, now we work in the service industry, so we, we leave our plant, but just think about it for a factory just to wrap your head around this. Everything in the factory space, so if we put the office in a side building, everything in the factory is a cost of goods sold. We look at our plant square footage. We look at our equipment, our labor, materials, consumable storage, transportation, and shipping is a cost of goods sold when we leave, when it leaves the facility to get to where we're going. And at the bottom, we look at net profit, and that's driven by volume, the margin, and the demand for our services. Price will impact whether we have huge demand or not. Uh, economy will, will determine whether we have it. Our customer book of business will determine whether we get that volume. But if you look at manufacturing and you compare it to what we do, it's very much the same. It's just a little easier to wrap your head around uh, a single plant. So if you want to wrap your head around it, use your restoration facility and go, what is my cost of goods sold to run this facility and come up with some numbers there? It's an interesting exercise, uh, but it gets really complex. I came up with this quote, I didn't mean to. If you were trained on one system that is better than any other uh, or better than another, you were trained to lose money. I, I said this in a class once and Peter came up and the next morning it was on my whiteboard and he's like, that's a classic quote. He's like, I'm not gonna forget it. Um, I didn't know it was, but it was written down. So I now quoted it. Um, what's interesting with this is that bid pricing and unit pricing and then if you were to back it up to rate and material pricing, bid pricing is the hardest if you don't have any system to it. If you're just trying to come up with a number out of the air, most people have a system to a bid. Most of the time, you're not going to say, hey, that house is $25,000. You're going to say the plumbing is four. I talked to the drywaller. That's six. Uh, Insulation is another one. You, you come up with a methodology of coming up with your bid. But bid pricing, when you have no context or experience, that's the hardest one. Unit pricing is the next hardest one because you're not building the unit pricing. So it's arguably either one of those is the hardest one um, because if you're not building the unit price, somebody else tells you what's in it and what's included and what's not, that's a harder situation to bid in. Uh, we've actually got some great chatter and some suggestions on the question, um, but I'd like to see what your opinion is. So the question is, what is the best way to get an advanced payment on fire losses? We have had adjusters agree to APs on site, but never follow through. What What's the uh, what, what was some of the answers? Could you uh, and maybe maybe it's too far back that you couldn't you couldn't pull some of those answers. No, I have one. It says send an invoice stating site walk agreements and discussions and copy the insured. 
include all protocols, i.e. claim number, policy number, insured information. Um, and then another one says site walks would be great. I haven't seen an adjuster on site in years. No, it's just rare, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> their models changed and, and it, you have to understand insurance companies have switched they used to just promote adjusters up and into the ranks and now they hire executives that come in from outside the industry. So, you know, it's looked at as a cost. And if you were to bring an adjuster and they'd be like, yeah, of course we have to see the site to be able to come up with a value. You couldn't just give it to a reviewer. Um, but to get to the question, I like that. Uh, I like the invoice. Another part of it is it's actually part of your contract. Your contract will say, you know, what's the stop work process. And there probably is a clause not everyone has it actually. So here's a clause that you would consider putting in. Talk to your lawyer, but this isn't real legal advice. You should have a stop work clause. If they miss a payment date, they normally get X number of hours or days, depending on it. If it's an emergency, it's normally hours. You have 48 hours to correct this, and you'll issue a correction notice saying, hey, you missed your payment date today. Maybe it's Friday. And they're like, hey, check didn't come in. It should be there Monday. Okay, you have 72 hours to have a check in our hand uh, before we stop work. And the stop work, if there's safety violations that are coming from it, uh, that's all on you. That is an interesting concept, but it's usually there's a stop work provision in your contract that is with the insured. And then if someone doesn't deliver the the payment, you would you would enforce your stop work and you would give notices and you would talk about the ramifications. I'll give you an example one. Uh, I had a job that I was consulting with where the insurance company didn't want to take the firewall. They didn't take the firewall consideration into play. They're like, just cut the drywall and get started and do your, your mitigation. But if you cut the drywall, you immediate, the fire department said there would be a 24 hour fire watch that would have to be put in play. So you have a scope disagreement, but then it became a disagreement about price. Well, we're not, we don't need to have that the AHJ enforced a fire watch. You need to then pay for the fire watch. And so before the walls were even cut, they had that discussion. But if they would have cut the wall, the company would have went bankrupt because they would have ran out of money. So that is a real possibility that you could run into. So yeah, I like it. You you, you put those terms in. Um, when I was an adjuster, we used to pre-order checks. So if you talk to the adjust, like if you guys go in and talk to the adjuster, say, hey, we're expecting this to be like, a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars i need five checks for twenty thousand dollars ordered as long as they're in your office we'll figure out the numbers and you can just drop them off when we hit the phases that works out pretty good that that's a good system if you have an adjuster that knows what they're doing and they can play the game and their company rules allow it but i i like that yeah i'd put that i take the advice that you got in there and that's uh that's good advice Wonderful. Um, <clears throat> another question we got was, where does Xactimate fit in? So I'm not going to talk specifically about the system. It, it's unit pricing. Uh, they've rolled out a T&M system. It doesn't, so this isn't an Xactimate specific, but any time that a system is built by somebody who's not doing the work or somebody that doesn't know your, your business job costs, um, someone that doesn't understand your specific way you're running the business it's really hard for them to just throw generic travel into there so I, all it is is a starting point now exact where core logics program anyone that builds a, a tnm program plumbing has them hvac has them they're all great they're a estimating tool they save you time coming up with a rough number and then you tweak it and get to a good number the problem is the insurance industry and the restoration industry not knowing how to use that system properly is built by it's being used by a bunch of people that don't understand the system it's now been manipulated into a pricing tool it was never designed that way bill loveland never designed it as a pricing tool it was an estimating tool to help him and so it's it's changed and morphed over the years and and the the big uh, period of time was like 2007 2008 around that market crash it moved from an estimating tool for contractors to a pricing tool for the industry it's not built that way so it's it's a unit price, but it's not. It's being now, you know, built by people that don't necessarily are in the field. It should be built by you. Like your price, every price list should be built by you. Every unit price should be basically built by a restorer. It's a little different. 
Well, going back to Xactimate, um, the question <laughs> is, so I know that Xactimate is the standard of billing, but can you unit price off of it without actually using it and be effective? Yeah. So, so you have to get in. So, so it's, oh, that's a, it's an interesting question. Um, you can build your price off of it. You, um, let's say a fire. If you had a fire and you have a natural fire where you have wood smoke and it's that dry, clean smoke, and then you've got a plastic fire where it's that greasy, wet smoke, that's four times longer, four to six times longer to clean than the dry smoke. If you grab the unit price that says clean surface, what's it cleaning? Are we cleaning dust? Are we cleaning ash? Are we cleaning greasy soot? You have to know that production rate and is it in hazardous conditions or is it a normal cleaning tech like they're doing your house after a, a weekend? Like it, it's there's a whole bunch of factors that I don't think have been factored in those pricing systems. So there's flaws in it. You could use it to build an estimate, but you also should have an understanding of what your production rates are. We'll get into that when we get into unit pricing. Well, I'm going to dig into some of the just things that you should consider that might not be uh, as relevant or top of mind right now. Yeah, we'll cover that in a bit. Perfect. Got time so, for one more? Yeah, a question from Ian. With a value price, say, fixing the 10K carpet for 2K, what if your repair doesn't work? Do you waive your bill? Yeah, I did. 100%. That's a great question. So value pricing has a low cost um, of applying the bill. So you just go in and it's like, if, if it's a half hour and I'm going to get paid two grand and I do five of them and one doesn't work, but my total cost on, let's say, let's say we did five of them and we made $10,000 and we had five hours of billable time to, to five different jobs. $100 is cost on each job. Uh, you know what, Mrs. Jones, I couldn't fix it. Uh, I'm going to try. So you don't guarantee the repair anyway, but if it doesn't work and it's not to satisfactory, it, maybe maybe there's fade. Hey, listen, you know what? We did our best. It's not a good repair. Um, no charge. 100%. Like Because you're selling the value. I, I'll 100% guarantee that that repair is good. And when we put the repair in, it'll last the life of the carpet. Why? You charge so much, you have to get the perceived value there. It's yeah, it's really, uh, um, there's a whole bunch of strategies around pricing value because it's totally different than everything else we do. Great question. Okay, let's jump in and, and we'll come back, Kristen. Uh, I want to get to the break so these guys get a break sort of at the halfway point. And then we'll uh, we'll come back in and, and we'll go through this. Here's a, an interesting concept. Um, private equity changed my life back in 2009 uh, 2010. In 2010, I went for a, an emerging national company that was one of the first, I don't know if it was the first, but it was one of the first private equity driven acquisitions in Canada. Um, and I was reluctant to go there. Their headhunters did an amazing job of bringing me into the, the process to get me to go there. They they didn't have a good reputation. Things weren't going well. Um, but what was interesting is during that, that process, they had actually in 2009, I went and worked for a small uh, oh, $8 million restoration firm, a small firm compared to where I was going to go. And I had increased sales and increased margin in that year. And at the same time, these guys were, were bleeding cash and, and it was pretty well known in the market. They were just struggling to get the rhythm of a restoration company. And I maybe was a little too confident, but in my interview, I had told them that I had increased top line revenue and bottom line profitability. And they called me on, on it and basically said, bullshit, there's no way you did it. And so I took our, our PL and I, I blacked out all the details. I showed them the top and I showed them the bottom, which was fine because our owners were bragging about how much they did. So it wasn't uh, it wasn't a market secret or a business secret, but I, I didn't show any of the guts. And I proved to them in 2009, we had taken a 2008 business that was struggling and we found profitability in 2009 when their business didn't. And it was kind of interesting. The, the, the pressure that you feel inside private equity is unlike anything that I've ever experienced in business. It's, it's, you know, Paul Donald will say private equity is an interesting thing. You have to have all your 
your ducks in a row, everything has to be set before you take on private equity money. What was interesting is in restoration, nothing had been tested and it was kind of new to the industry. So they had large budgets that they need to spend to try to correct the problem because they were in pretty deep. So I went to this course and I, I, I had, I was in charge of all the estimators and they said, Hey, when you start day one, your job is to go find out why we lost money. Not only did they lose money, they went from 66 million to 44 and our numbers were upside down. We, we had lost money in, in my branch. Um, they were bleeding cash and they said, Hey, we have some budget. You can take your budget and go do what you want. And I went and evaluated all the systems and I realized that we started to lose money on buttonology and we were using unit pricing t &M, and bids and we were pretty good on t &M. so and then we looked at bids and we were pretty good on bids but when we looked at our unit pricing we were all over the map we'd win some we'd lose some we'd just absolutely be blown out of the water we had infighting i had project managers saying hey you know your job cost your carpenters took way more time than we allocated and so what i said is i said to our team is i need to take all of our estimators and we're going to go get some training. We're going to learn how to make money with the system. And what was happening is, is I went to this, uh, I took them all on the road. I walked into the room. And when I walked in, I said to the trainer, I said, hey, can we focus on, on how to make money with the system? Like, you've taught us all morning how to click buttons. I want to learn how to make money. And he goes, yeah, that's not here. Like, you're going to use it however you use it to make money. And I went, what? No, but like, we literally have like, half a company here uh we need to figure out how to make money and he's like no we're teaching you how to use the system we, we're not going to teach you how to make money and I, I was furious like i walked out of the room one i'm in a private equity environment where every dollar you spend you have to justify the roi on two i literally took everybody out of their office and away from home to come do this and i hyped it up because i thought we were going to learn it so we were out of the office for four days i'm wasting three days of their time um it was like a bad situation. So what happens is the way I work is I get mad, I think, and then I come up with a plan. And so I got mad, I walked away, I went for a walk, and then I came back. And I was a little bit of a, a savage with my plan is that night I stayed up till three in the morning and I read ahead in the book and I asked, I figured out every question I needed to ask to learn this buttonology that I was about to be taught. And the next morning I got in early and I was that guy. I was the guy in early asking questions right up to class. At break, I had another set of questions. I asked them all break. At lunch, I followed the instructor around and I asked him questions. At, at dinner time, I did it. And before he wrapped up, I'm asking him everything. And I didn't give that instructor. I've been an instructor now. I didn't give him a break. That buttonology, I need to understand how that entire system worked before we left. And my estimators were laughing because they're like, like you're not, you're relentless. I needed to understand it. My job was probably on the line because I, I needed to figure out how are we going to make money, money in unit pricing. The trainers that train buttonology are training you not how to be a good estimator. They're teaching you how to be a good system operator of an estimating tool. That's different than being a good estimator. And so what happened is, is when we were sitting in that class, I realized that there's a really high learning curve to the estimating system because it's built a certain way. And as I started to work my way through it, I started to see that the pieces were starting to break up in, the, in that system. The system is built because they have they had a, a mindset that they, they ran through. The problem you run into is that we train some of the most inexperienced people and we put them as an estimator and we say, you're really good with a computer, you go estimate. That's assuming that the estimating tool is right. And that's also assuming that that person can put all the little pieces together of that puzzle and, and come up with a story. The best estimators that I've ever had were experienced restorers that did time in the field, they had training, and they understood the system. Now, in a, in a program, and we'll talk about program effects or program uh, work, in a program, some people are really good at learning the rules of what you can and can't do, but really good estimators learn how and what needs to be done because they have the experience. So then they know how to charge and they know how much time things take. Totally different effect when you do that. And, you know, you have to document the field to justify the invoice. Well, you have to know what you're looking for to get that number to work for you. So you're asking estimators and project managers to pull down profits in a chaotic environment 
using a system that was designed by whoever, wherever, that may not have the experience that you have in that business. And so that's the disconnect. The system is built right. The guts of it might not be. If you ever looked at this, I've talked about this in a, in a bunch of talks over the years, uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect. If you haven't thought about this in your business, you need to consider this in your business. This is the exact reason why as an owner or leader in a business, uh, you have someone who's coming into the business. Um, you need to understand the hype that a new person brings to the business and why you might look at a seasoned pro and be like, well, they're kind of crusty. They're, they're a little discouraged. But look at this new person. They got these exciting ideas. Estimating is one of the most complex things that you can run into. And you're often asking people to work some magic with some, some really shoddy information at best. Uh, for others, if you sub this out, if you sub your estim estimating out, you're now decoupling your operations from how you charge. I think it's insane, but a lot of people do it. Maybe you do it in a cat because you need to, to hold some water at that time and, and you need to keep everything buttoned down. But here's why the Dunning-Kruger effect really changes the way you look at restoration. You can apply it to estimating. Also think about applying it to everything else you do. Uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect it works on two axes, confidence and knowledge. Knowledge is usually acquired with time, but not always. Sometimes it's the experience. Uh, but what happens is when you come in, you go through this curve. Everyone goes through it. Think of a time when you when you you know uh, were a parent or you played sports. You pick up a, a, a baseball bat, and if you've never swung it, it feels funny. You hit the ball a few times, and you think you're a hero. You're going to be slamming home runs. You catch a ball a few times. You feel really good until you start playing at game speed, and then you don't feel so good about yourself. Everyone that comes in and learns something new becomes ignorant and they're the FNG and FNG stands for the fucking new guy. When you're there, you're the most confident you're ever going to be. And you're going to tell everybody what you do because you don't know what you don't know. After you play the game for a while, you get a few courses under your belt. You go into this fear stage, you get into the minors. A lot of estimators go there really quick. They take a buttonology course and then you put them in the real world and they run up against reviewers and they realize they're asked questions that they have no idea what the answers are and they enter this fear stage really quick. When you enter the fear stage, you make really bad decisions because you're scared. And so what your goal is, is to get someone out of this curve. Everybody goes through it, guys. I did a, I did a, a fire loss specialist class. I said, guys, this is where, where we are and here's where I am on the curve. And they're like, man, that's where we're all sitting at. When you get a lot of knowledge, the more knowledge you get, the deeper that curve will come. The goal is to shorten the curve. Everyone goes there. You got to shorten that curve and get yourself to a knowledgeable professional or professional or an experienced superstar. You'll never be as confident as you were when you were new. And so what happens is that confidence gap is where we see our old estimators or our older project managers that have experience. They're not enjoying things because usually there's, a, there's an education gap in there. There's a disconnect. And so what you have to do is you have to realize that those people that are on the knowledgeable and professional side almost always turn a really good profit. Uh, if they're now they could be in the business 30 years and not have that, that experience to have that. So it's not just based on time, it's knowledge. If they're really knowledgeable uh, or they're on that experienced superstar state, they're going to turn numbers where other people can't. Where you run into hit and misses is when people are living in fear. And it's usually a lack of training or a lack of organizing the thoughts into a way that you can use it in the field. Then you get into the ignorant side. You don't know what you don't know. So you're just writing numbers in the system, hoping that it's right. That is a crazy spot. And that's where buttonology keeps you. They give you all the confidence that you know how to use the system, but there's none of the underlying information that tells you how the theory of estimating works or the theory of unit pricing works or how to apply it to the field. And here's where you're going to trip. And here's what you need to look for. None of that's taught to you. So you're learning how to use a system thinking you're an estimator. And really you just learned the tool. You didn't learn how to estimate. When we start to look at that, we call it the false sense of knowledge. False sense of knowledge will hurt your business. Um, there's, there's a, a trap that I fell into is that I did buttonology with my team. When my partner got sick, I had to quickly ramp up and fill the void of, of having somebody who was in the business. 
uh, I gave my my people the false sense of knowledge. I gave them buttonology. So I came in and was like, hey, I'm Canada's only independent Xactivate trainer. Look what I can do. And I taught them buttonology. And then I taught them a little bit about water. And I taught them a little bit about fire and a little bit about asbestos and mold. And what I did is I basically gave them the false sense of knowledge that they were actually really skilled when really they're just at their infancy. They're just learning the concepts. They don't know how to put it together. They don't know where the risks are. I put our entire business at risk because I gave them that. And then because I lived uh, 17 hours drive, four hours flight away, I wasn't there every day to mentor them. I was in there once every other week. Um, my details guy was off sick, so I wasn't in a position to be there. So I couldn't mentor my team. So I had this really confident team that I thought was really confident, uh, a bunch of young people doing good things, right intentions. I set them up for failure because I gave them buttonology and, and I gave them that false sense of knowledge. We started to get into trouble with adjusters. We started to have adjusters complain, hey, why are you guys doing this? This is goofy. I review a file and I'm like, I don't know why they did that. Well, because they thought they had everything figured out. And what happens is you see good contractors that can talk to people that are interested in constructions. They can actually do more without knowing the system. They can come up with better prices. That buttonology is where you get yourself into some trouble. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's, a, it's, it's a problem. It becomes a bigger problem to your organization when you do this. When you surround yourself with peers who have a false sense of knowledge, you make yourself dumber and dumber with time. So if you're a leader in a business, that's okay. But if you're on Facebook and you see somebody who's got, you don't know, somebody has six months of, no, of knowledge, they took one course and they're talking like they know everything that there is about restoration on Facebook. You don't know if that's helping or hurting your business because they're talking about that false sense of knowledge. You'll see that with Estimate. I, like, I, I don't live in social media because I don't know who I'm dealing with. If you are surrounding yourself with um, with people like that, you should be in the mentoring role if you're the experienced one. But if you're sitting there trying to take information in with that false sense of knowledge, you're like, eh, it kind of doesn't make sense. You're going to lose your mind. Uh, today, I spend most of my time in a different group. I now hang out with the superstars and the experienced, knowledgeable people because what happens is when you hang around with that environment, you start to get better you think about projects differently. You think about restoration in a different mindset. And so it's, it might be a little harsh, but when you deal with people with a false sense of knowledge, your job is to coach them and get them past the minors where they're in fear and get them to a knowledgeable state. It's just, it's interesting inside your business. You might have someone that's been in your business 20 years. They have a false sense of knowledge and they impart that on the rest of your business. It can bring your business down. Estimating is probably one of the biggest gaps that you see because it's hard to touch. Water damage, you can see the equipment placed. Estimating, it's hard to see a number on the screen and figure out if it was put there for the right reasons. Um, if you're here, you might have some of that false sense of knowledge. That's okay. You're here. You're, you're like, give me more. If you're in the miners and you have that fear, you're like, hey, give me some more information. I'm, I'm trying to put this together. From the sounds of the chat, we have experienced people that are like, hey, I may have some knowledge. But I also know there's things I don't know, and now I can help impart some of that knowledge on other people to help them because they're now in a mentoring part of their business. That's what you need to be careful of. And I never even realized that we had that in our business when I was running it. Estimating is the process of, of forecasting the cost resources required to complete a project. And this may include calculating quantities, the cost of materials, labor, equipment, and other expenses based on a mutually agreed scope of work. Now, that mutually agreed scope of work may be you setting it and someone else reviewing it, but it used to be that we would agree on the scope. And the purpose of estimating is to provide an accurate, comprehensive budget that reflects the expected costs, covers overhead, and delivers the anticipated profit margins. The profit margins is important. If you're building a unit price, you need to know how much you plan on making for either that unit or the combination of multiple units. Are you going to deliver a profit? Did you cover your costs? Uh, most people aren't looking at it that way. And so it becomes one of these challenges that as an estimator, are you doing all this? Do you know what your costs are? Do you know what the scope is? It's really hard when you sit in a desk and you have to write the number. You have to think about it on a couple different planes. Here's a question I, I, I put in the poll. Uh, there are processes that you have to put in place because you, 
or are there processes that you've put in place because you've been punished by one client uh, and you applied it to all clients? So in here, this is interesting. Um, the reason I ask this is that you come into a, a job where sometimes you're told you can and can't do stuff. You can't charge for service charges. You can't uh, charge for labor, for travel. You can't do something. And estimators get that. And then what happens is you start to apply that to your general book of business. Um, it's an interesting thing, right? And it's part of, it's part of, I've watched companies where they actually took the entire, the most rigid. So SLAs is different. If you take the most rigid SLAs, service level agreements, like time, like we'll call the customer back in 15 minutes and another company's 30 minutes and another company's 45, say, hey, we'll call them back in 15. Oh, perfect. We got good participation. So we've got uh, in there, most of you said sort of, we charge for everything we can and let the reviewer do it. That's 35%, sort of. We're more cautious for how we charge. A few people say, hey, we were punished and, and, and that happens. And then, no, we haven't had to. Uh, those are your independent operators, probably not playing in programs. Uh, they're doing that. Here's the thing. It's human nature when you're in an environment that you're going to run in and be cautious. And a lot of you are, is that you're cautious of, are you going to get things clawed back? It becomes a behavior. And we call it the estimating trap. So the estimating trap is a phenomenon that I discovered in 2008. At the time I was, before I was working for private equity, uh, where I learned the value of money and investing, uh, I was managing and reviewing estimates from different companies. And I noticed this trend in the estimating desk mm -hmm. is that our profits in the, would flow from the project managers. And I stopped to think about it because I actually saw this. I saw this trend where our project managers were having margin compression. But in 2007, I was, I was working for a large national franchise. And part of my role was to sell franchises. So they were like, hey, go out and meet with some prospects. You're out meeting with our own offices. Go see if you can find some new ones. And as I was going through it, I started to see these established businesses that their financials look like this. Now, we only normally look at like a four-year or three-year or five-year picture. And this was the generic company that I looked at. is increasing sales, decreasing margin, increasing costs, and lower net profits. Sound familiar? Maybe, maybe not, right? Um, I know, right? Because when you start to look at this, it's like, well, hold on. That is kind of like every business. At the time, um, all my reports that I was writing to head office said, hey, these businesses are in decline. They're not very good quality. Uh, look at them. They're they're losing money or they're, they're not making as much money. And the CEO was like, I 100% agree. These are not candidates that we want to do business with. What I didn't know then was that the, there was a changing environment taking place with unit pricing coming in and rate and material going out and bid pricing not as common. And then I was like, well, that doesn't explain it because you kind of see this, like I see this in businesses today, the exact same curve is happening. Anywhere between five and 10 years of running a business and restoration, you get this curve that comes in. And old timers in the business, had, when I started, were like, oh, 20 years ago, you could make really good money, but not today. 10 years later, you heard old, like the younger old timers be like, hey, you, you could make a lot more money back then, but not today. If, if you consider me an, a, a younger old timer now, and for some of you guys, don't say it, but I'm probably an old timer to you. The It's true. 20 years ago, 15 years ago, it was easier to make money than it is today, except for if you're here today. If you're here today, some of you, and our survey showed it, some of you are crushing profit. And so it's easier to make money today than it was before, but 50% of you are struggling to make profit. And so this concept came up that as I started to look at it, I was like, well, I've always heard this, but there's never been a period of time where that's true. And so when you learn from your environment, you start to apply your situation. It goes back to psychology. Learned behavior is a really interesting concept. We use it um, all over the world we use it all over our normal lives uh in psychology there's multiple stories that start that, that, that demonstrate this if you've ever heard there's a five monkey experiment five monkeys and a ladder i think is the is the street uh term for this this experiment and the monkeys learn 
that if they go for the banana up on the ladder, they're going to get hosed with water and it's cold and they suffer pain. And so they do it until the, everyone learns that you don't go for bananas on a ladder. And then they pull a monkey out and they put a new monkey in. And when he goes up to go get the, the bananas, they, they all the monkeys pull him down because they, they've learned we don't go for bananas, but the new guy doesn't know it. And after you start swapping the monkeys out, they all try to go up the ladder. Um, at one point, they never were sprayed, but all the monkeys don't go up the ladder. They all, if you put a new monkey in, he goes for the ladder, they all pull him down. They have no idea why. The other experiment is, is with fleas. So if you were to take a jar and then you were to go and put a bunch of fleas in there, um, the fleas actually will jump out and they'll jump higher than the jar. So they're wild fleas. They No one's told them any rules. They come in and they jump higher than the jar. When you put the jar together or you go in and you put some restrictions on them, and you can see the fleas here. It, it took it out of a video, so it's a little grainy. But right there, you see some fleas that are jumping out of the jar. When you come in and you cap it and you put a limit on it, you create this environment that everybody sees that you can't go higher than the lid. And in the case of fleas, it's like three days to set their memory and and train them that they can't jump higher than the lid. The lid becomes the barrier, becomes the expectations that are set. And once they're set, they they can't overcome what they've learned. You take the lid off, no fleas jump out. They jump as high as the lid. They'll never jump higher than the lid. Uh, and then what's wild is if you take the limitation away from them, they don't even need a jar. They'll just never jump higher than the lid. And what's really wild is their offspring will never jump higher than the lid. Once you set this, you've set a course of history for that flea family that they will never uh, exceed that lid. Your business is a little bit like that, that when you start to learn rules uh, set by others that are punishing and rewarding you, you're going to uh, effectively get that learned behavior and you're going to, it's going to affect the way you price. It's going to affect the way you look at the business. Kind of think of it like putting a kid on a stair. That's not my kid, by the way, but, uh, but, it, but I do use it with the kids. You put your kid, you give them a penalty for doing something that's not right. You put them on the stair. Uh, one, if you've got two kids, one kid sees the other kid on the stair and, and they know that they shouldn't do something where everybody's going to get punished that way. Think about it like if you're in a franchise group and one franchise gets kicked off a list, everyone else is a little bit more cautious about why you got kicked off a list. Uh, here's a parenting pro tip. If you put your kid on the stair, uh, next time punish both of them just for one kid's bad behavior. Put them both on the stair if they're not listening, the good kid and the bad kid. And then when you leave the room, uh, the good kid's going to gonna make sure that the bad kid knows exactly what they shouldn't do. And if you really want to mix it up, when the bad kid does something, just put the good kid on the stair. And when you leave the room, you know justice is going to get handed out. And no more bad behavior is going to happen. I don't know if you're going to get good kids with that, but it's a pro tip. You can try it. And for those of you that are single or don't have kids and you're like, hey, that kind of sounds a little sinister, wait till you have kids and then you'll totally understand. It's a, it's a parenting technique. Click subscribe, follow for more parenting ideas like this. But these are like monkeys in a jar when you start applying it to different situations. We, as, as professionals, in a really confined environment of restoration and insurance restoration, we are basically influenced by the rules that were provided. I'll tell you, this actually came up in a real world situation. So, um, in 2022, 2023, and 2024, I sat on the IICRC's S700. That's the new smoke and fire standard that's coming out. Um, that's actually not important. But what's interesting is that we had really good professionals that were working in this environment. And the language that you had from some people that had done a lot of program work for their career, years and years of being in programs, is that they had learned experiences that, they, that was their reality. And then you start talking to people that are maybe a little bit more free, a little bit more independent in the, the way they run their business. And so I would usually get asked a question about documentation. And the easiest thing for me to have said is, yes, all jobs should be documented and Encircle is a great tool to use. But the reality is, could you dry a job without documenting it? If you documented for a homeowner and they, you gave them a wet check and they went around and they beat the meter around the walls and you came in and you checked it and you got to a dry standard and you got your drying goals met. Do you need to document it? You don't need to. You should, but you don't need to. Or sorry, it's recommended you do, but you don't need to. So 
when we talked about documentation, it was you don't need to, but it's it's probably recommended that you do it because you'll want some information to get paid. But what was wild is as we were talking, some of the people that were in program work were like, you must have photos of every piece of equipment. You must have photos of everything that you're doing. And it's like, wait, what? No, that's what it work. That's what a field report's for. Like, why would you do that? That's what, like, no, you're not going to, like, that's insane. What they were doing is taking learned behavior from programs and the program rules and applying it to that's how you do restoration. And it's like, no, you don't have to do that. But you do if you're in that jar. And so you learn those rules. Now, it's nothing wrong if you're happy and healthy and you're making the business run in that jar. And I came out of the industry where 95% of my work in Canada came from like a program, like a TPA environment, uh, Carrier Direct. You can make it work, but it's just that's not the only way to make it work. So you have to just be careful when you're estimating that you're not applying these learned rules. And a bunch of you on the last survey said, hey, we're doing our own thing. Just understand, the only reason you're cautious is because someone else set the rules for you, and then they imposed it on you. The estimating traps, I, I can't get into the psychology exactly of, of this. I, I, do, I can do it in a different format. But, but right now, when you look at observational learning, there's a whole bunch of trends that go in to, to, to get that behavior learned. It has to be a repeated learned behavior. Um, it creates margin compression. So... If you always are told not to do emergency service call out and five of your vendors say, or five of your carriers say no emergency service call outs. When you get an independent job, chances are you don't charge emergency service call outs. You've learned from five different carriers that you're not charging for it. When you do work for a private company, you probably don't charge for it either. You give up that margin because you've learned it over here and you've applied it here. That's one of the most common mistakes that a company makes is that they take learned behaviors from a environment without having some kind of neutral balance of, of where you are. Uh, conformity feels safe. Your estimators get beat every time they send something in that's a little different. They they feel that pain. So then what they do is they avoid pain by not putting in those line items. And even when no pressure is applied, you still follow those rules. That's true. So then when we get into program, a bunch of you guys ask questions about programs, which I'm going to share with you a Canadian experience, but I know it's not. And so that's my, my past history, but I know it's, it's true for, for non-Canadians. I've, I've worked with Americans and Australians, but this story puts it all together is that when you look at programs, sometimes they're incubators for bad ideas. Sometimes they're actually, they can, they can incubate really good processes for your business. Usually it's by accident. Like as a, as a general rule, an insurance carrier creates a program to protect their business. It doesn't mean that it's going to help you protect your business. You have to do that on your own. And you have to evaluate whether their rules and your rules are compatible. Uh, the reverse is true. If you don't do program work, sometimes you learn bad behaviors that will actually make your business not as efficient, not as effective. And so there's the other side of it is that no rules. Sometimes you'll be a wild restorer and you'll just find yourself struggling to make money. Somewhere in between is the right answer. Um, one side or the other. But here's what's, what, what's interesting is you sign these agreements. So you can't sign an agreement for volume and then bitch and complain that you've now signed an agreement that they don't, they've told you what the rules are and then they, they, maybe there's some unwritten rules. You sign an agreement saying, I want to do business with this person or this company. If you're doing business with them, whatever the fallout is, there's the fallout and you got to deal with it. That's just the way it is. You signed an agreement to, 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 to interact with that company. So you've made a business decision that you're going to trade volume for some margin. You're going to trade volume for some administrative headaches. You're going to trade volume for a review process that an independent isn't going to experience. The independent has made a decision that they don't want the program work. They want to go hunt and gather and get their own work, and they're going to charge a premium to do that. And that's all this is. Now, what's interesting is, when I was talking about those owners, getting back to that 2007, 2008, where we saw this margin compression, but sales were expanding. And I had discussions with owners that were like, no, no, no. When I get to the next million, when I get to 15 million, business is going to make money. I'm like, your trend is, you're not going to make, you're going to make more money, but less margin. Like, that's how you're trending. You're not, you're not going the right way. Um, arguably, 
those restorers that I looked at, 15 years in the business, more knowledge, more experience. They've been through the ups and downs. They know how to price. They know the game, but they just all of a sudden are are diverging from profitability. And they went to franchises going, hey, you can save my company. You can help get me more work because I need more work to feed the beast so that we can make more money. Uh, here's what was interesting is I only looked at a couple of companies' financials before. And in the years past or years since, I've actually looked at a, a bunch. And this is almost the, the exact trend. You'll see margin when a company starts, they get low volume, high margins. This is the the, the uh, Chuck in the truck days or a man, a van and a fan days. You start off and no one's told you you can't charge a certain way. So you just put your equipment out. You got lower overheads and you charge and you get bigger margins on your files. And as you get through your niche book of business, maybe it's a half million dollars, maybe it's a hundred grand, whatever that number is, it doesn't matter. When you get through that niche business, you go to expand your, your shop, you go to expand your business into the into more uh, restoration. Normally you get into more professional adjusters, property managers, people that start putting rules in place. You adopt those rules, your margins come down, your volumes go up. You accept those rules, and then as the company is growing and you're you're told to grow your business, you grow your business and you take on more restrictive work. And when you take on more restrictive work, you apply those restrictions back to all the work you did before and you start applying those restrictions further back and your margin tanks and you take on more volume and your margin tanks. And I only saw the companies at the crossroad. I didn't see the company's financial histories 10, 15 years. Almost every business that gets into that margin compression if you go back for the, I think it was 50% of you, if you go back and you look at your business and you say, hey, actually, that's what my lines look like. They, they're they doing the split here. Chances are you've got some of that, that learned behavior that has now gone across your entire book of business and your business is, is tanking. Uh, your margins are dropping. I wouldn't say tanking, but your margins are dropping. Some of you have lost money. You were in a position like this and your volume dropped, but because your margins were low, it pulled you down as well. And so that's one of the things that you need to be uh, aware of is that it's probably a learned behavior. It's not your business necessarily operating poorly. It's that we learned a bad behavior, we put it in, and now we just got to find it and go take it out. Programs, as a general rule, are inefficient. So generally, when we get into programs that are inefficient, we're in a position where they were built by rules of others and applied to your business. You now have restrictions. Think about it like being a horse in, in, in a field where you can run wherever you want, you can go graze wherever you want, to now you have a fence and you can graze anywhere you want within that fence. Well, you can't get to the creek, you can't go up the mountain, but you can enjoy life inside the fence. And it's not a bad life. So that's what you do when you do programs, but the program inefficiency is corralling your business. Sometimes you can pick up some some improvements to your business. Sometimes you don't. Uh, at the end of the day, when we when we look at it, if you're looking for your niche business and you go in and go, oh, the program's going to fix it, you're taking on inefficiencies that you didn't know, you didn't build a business for. Some of the best businesses were built for TPAs. Like they built their business to do TPA work. They're like, hey, I'm built to be inside that fence and I'm going to work really hard inside that fence and I'm going to make it work. There's some very, very profitable businesses that function inside the TPA model, usually because they don't apply the TPA rules across the entire book of business. That set of rules applies to only that TPA and this set of rules apply only that TPA. And they're very segmented. And I don't even know if they realize that that's what they do, but um, that's the, the way you can kind of get your business aligned as you determine, do you have rules in place? Do you not have rules in place? Are they really strict? If they're that strict, can we even make money here? Should we just jettison the uh, the volume and get back to a smaller restoration company? It's, it's an interesting concept. All right, guys, we're going to do five minute question period, uh, question and answer period. I'm just talking to Kristen because I don't think we have one on the screen. So just so she's ready. <laughs> no worries. Um, so first question, I work with third parties that are reducing invoices for the carriers. The most common revision request is above exactimate pricing. I use a comment that exactimate presents historical pricing data, but that we use regional market pricing. 
I give an example of a homeowner getting three estimates of work and choosing from that. Is there a better way to address that issue? It, so without knowing the specifics, it depends. Um, if you're in a, a now, if you've signed a TPA agreement, and, and I'm assuming you're not, but if you did sign a TPA agreement, then you can't do that. If you didn't sign the agreement, but all of a sudden a TPA shows up, technically they're not part of your contract. So the fact that you're engaging with them is is complimentary. Um, it's it's a consideration. You're 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 trying to work with them, but the user agreement for Exactware is very explicit. It's that the prices should be changed. It can be changed. Um, I'll, here's what I'll tell you: it depends. It depends on how you set the contract up, and then it depends on how you built the estimate to get to the review. Because there's a whole bunch of things that need to happen first in order for you to get to the review and be like, hey, all the pre, pre-work was done. Now we're at the review and, and look back at my contract and look back at the communications here. This is the this is how we're gonna charge you. It, it just, it, it depends. Um, what are your thoughts on using a third party company for estimating? It seems that with the points you're making, it's essential that our estimators understand our own pricing sheets of which a third party estimating company probably wouldn't be able to do. What are your thoughts? So I like the third party estimators in the sense that if you don't have the skill and you need to buy, like it's a rent versus own. I'd rather own an estimator that knows our our operation than, than to rent it out. It's kind of like if you were to like making pizza and you had a pizza shop and then you're like, hey, you know, I'm going to set the price of pizza and you call a guy in New York and you're like, what's the price of a pizza? And they're like, I don't know, like $40. You're like, perfect. And that's not the price of pizza in your market. And that's not even the pizza you sell. You having someone come in and price a job after you've done it makes almost no sense. Like unit pricing done that far out behind and it's now trailing. What are you billing for? Did you bill for anything that you did? Did they just go and find numbers and add it to the estimate? Because those numbers could be charged for. Unit pricing is a, a weird system that, and, and, and it leads to more audit, but it's a weird system because when you use third-party estimators, unless they have a complete comprehensive file and you told them exactly what to do, they're kind of picking line items that may or may not have actually got done. So it's it's really tough to do that. I like I like having in-house estimators. Um it's it it just to me, if you decouple pricing from operations, like now you've given up the the bit if you're not making money in operations, the only place you can make it up is on estimating. If you decouple it, how do you figure out what your costs are? And how do you figure out where you got to get good at estimating? And a whole bunch of reasons I wouldn't do it, but there's some reasons I would, I guess is probably the, the convoluted answer. Um, how can we charge for the OMP in restoration? Great question. So traditionally in the in the past, it's built into on top of the estimate, people wanted to see it. Uh, the courts, this is probably going back 30 years. O&P used to be that it was only like, there was an argument, three trades. You'll see this sometimes. It's three trades and then you can put it on and you can't put it on. There's, if, there's only a few courts that have ruled that it's not applicable to the job. So almost all the time, even in contents, overhead, or sorry, not in contents, um, in restoration, O&P could be applied based on case history uh, in in the United States. In Canada, overhead and profit is, if it's assumed that you're going to incur it, then you pay it. And so it depends where you are jurisdictionally through law. Again, not a lawyer, but I did stay at a holiday in last night. So there's a whole bunch of things that you could factor in. I don't know why we show it. So in Canada, we show overhead and profit on mitigation. In the States, a lot of you don't. Uh, a lot of areas, they say, hey, you can't show it. Build it into the price. It's part of the price. You put your numbers in there. O&P is built in. It's a fake number anyway. It doesn't even matter. So I don't know why we show it. Um, it used to matter more because there used to be less case law that would say that the insurance carrier didn't have to pay O&P on top of 
the invoice because it, it the insured could go get it from like whatever the GC rate was. I don't know. I don't the honestly I'd build a price list. I wouldn't even put it in there. It just my labor rates are X, Y, and Z, and there's a forty percent margin on everything that we do that like materials we buy or that aren't or sub trade invoices we put a forty percent margin on everything or a thirty percent margin and that's it. Like that's that there's a better way to build an estimating system. You're playing with other people's rules that haven't necessarily thought about building your business an estimating system. Um, can we always request an independent adjuster for carriers that we don't have a contract with? Some carriers want us to follow the same rules that their preferred contractors do, but not the case with an IA. Oh, that's a good question. It wouldn't hurt if you got the relationship. So I used to do small town work. We never had any, we had three company adjusters and they were the ones that left. Everyone else was independent. So they could kind of get a little bit more leeway. Uh, the rules didn't apply to them. So you could ask for that. Um, it wouldn't be a bad thing if you have a relationship with the independent adjuster or you just, you've had a bad experience. The other thing is, and, and this is a tougher one, if you do work with a really, a really poor uh, company that you know it's going to be hard, sometimes you might just want to walk away from those jobs. We had one carrier where I did not, I could not make it work. We just stopped taking the work. Like it was not worth the volume because the margins were so low. The margins were below our, our overhead costs. So every dollar we pumped into the into their book of business, we lost money. We just were like, we can't do it. We do, we'll, we'll shrink the company. We'll right size the company but to not do your work. Think about it like rebuild. If you were doing renovations, would you take every renovation that came through the door or would you start picking and choosing? One of our issues is that we have a mindset and mitigation that we take everything. The reality is I might not take it from certain carriers if I find out you're with a carrier for a certain area. Nope, I'm not dealing with that and I'm not dealing with their garbage and I'm not dealing with all the headaches that it's going to put into my business. I will go find work from these other carriers that I like to do business with. That's a hard decision. It's easier said if you if you don't have if you have the volume. It's harder to say when you don't have volume. Um, but that's yeah, it's it's a request that you can make, and you don't have to follow the rules. By you know, your contract may say that you're charging ten and ten, and their their rules say, hey, no emergency service callouts and ten and five. Cool. I didn't sign a contract with you as the uh, as the carrier. So, now, do you have a price list that can make it work? I don't know. It's a, it's a business decision. You'd have to get down into more like the the mechanisms of, of how much is it costing you to, to not do business. Sorry, it's hard to answer those questions without more information. Like I'm trying to answer them based on a set of facts that I have in my head, which may not even relate to what you're doing. So it's, it's hard to answer those specific questions, but you know, it's an answer, it's maybe not the right answer. We do have a couple more questions. Um, yeah, let's do that. And then, and then we let's do three more minutes of questions and we'll take 15 minute break. Beautiful. Um, so how do you explain to a reviewer that the yield rates are too low to complete the unit cost task? Yeah, so sometimes you have to demonstrate it. Um, you know, a big one would be like, like detach and reset toilet is, is probably a perfect example of we're in a mitigation, we detach the toilet, plumber comes in, detaches the toilet. They're not resetting it until a month later. So detach and reset. And then some, what used to happen is the adjusters would be like, oh, well, we'll charge half now and half later. Well, that doesn't work either because one, it takes less time to take it out than it does to put it back. Two, it's not, it doesn't represent the, the, the actual event that's taking place. So you have to use two line items to do that, detach and reset. Well, we're detaching it and then we're resetting it. Well, are we adding water lines? And so the yields are wrong because it's only based, it's based on that you're going to detach and reset on one trip. But what if you're going to do two trips? Well, now you're in just two service minimums. If you're just doing toilets, you got a $300 service minimum charge to take it out and a $300 service minimum charge to put it back in. And then you may have some material costs to go on top of that service charge. That's $600 versus whatever line item is, $150. So unit pricing and yield are, they're disconnected. They're fake numbers. And and we're, when we get into the next section, I'll, I'll get into this. And then um, 
uh, Kristen, if you can put the, we'll, we'll come back to this question in, in the next section, because we're going to talk about unit pricing and yield and production rates. For those that aren't familiar with it, we'll cover it and then we'll answer this question. Okay, perfect. Yeah, for sure. Um, do you want to take one more question and then we'll have to break? Go, yeah, let's go one more question. Okay, so how do you handle non-TPA pushback on not paying for ESRVD or charging for the documentation for billing? Yeah, so so you, everything's a business decision, right? When you build your when you build your um, estimate up, and and there's a whole bunch of concepts that come to this. It's you know, are you playing by somebody else's rules? So someone created a uh, the emergency service call out line item, and let's say it's two hundred dollars, but your labor rate instead of being whatever the price in the price list is with $50 is now $100 so that call out is a $500 minimum can you charge it sure is someone going to pay it well the homeowner and you have a contract the question becomes well what happens when someone doesn't want to pay for those services are you running maybe then a time and material invoice until you figure out if it's unit pricing and so all your systems then this is this is where we're going to go by by the end of today is all your systems have to be think you have to be understanding who you're dealing with as a client and how are you presenting so not everything's a unit pricing estimate not everything's a tnm estimate or a rate and material estimate um how do you deal with people it's business decision are we willing to take something off to get a paycheck did we do the work without a commitment there's a whole bunch of factors that you that's kind of hard to answer that question but it it would be it would the easy answer would be it depends, but I know that's not what you're looking for. So let's let's make an assumption here. We have a contract with the homeowner, and in our contract, we are vague in how we charge you for that service callout. If we're vague about how we charge you for that service callout, it's really hard to go and take that paper to the homeowner and say, you owe me for this. So now you're left to debate with an adjuster uh, or someone, a property manager. If I'm dealing with a property manager, well, that's a relationship, hopefully, or we're working towards a relationship. So they say, hey, never charge us for emergency service call out. Cool. My hourly rate is now $5 more an hour so I can cover those emergency service call outs on every hour we ever work for you. It's just, it's a pricing scheme. Uh, and they call it that, like you'll hear insurance companies call it a pricing scheme. Your pricing scheme is when I deal with a certain insurance company, this is my pricing scheme for that company. When I deal with a different company, I just go straight rate and material because they they get it. Um, when I deal with this uh, uh, independent adjuster, I use the unit pricing scheme and it's modified so that I don't run into those pitfalls. It, it's, it's a good question. It's just to simplify it, you have to go through all five estimating systems and build them the right way for your business. And then, and then you pick them off the shelf and, you know, unit pricing has two modifications. T and M uh, rate and materials has two modifications. You have value pricing, which you might sell to an adjuster, and and be like, hey, our emergency service callouts is you pay six hundred dollars, and we do the assess assessment and the emergency service callout and everything. That's our initial visit call plus whatever we do. Like you come up with a pricing scheme that makes sense that the other side can understand. And uh, that's probably the best advice. It's it's different than how you're going to do it today, because today the systems just they they lead to conflict and they make it hard for the insurance company to understand it, and they make it hard for you to do business. Like you know, you have to simplify things for yourself and and your business. Yeah. So we're going to get into unit pricing here, and whether you do Xactimate, you do CoreLogic, Simility, or or their program. Uh, you come up with your own unit pricing. Uh, this applies to, to everything that you guys are doing. I was going to set my screens here so I can see what we're, where you guys are. All right. Now, when you get into to unit pricing, there's a lot into it. And I saw in there, you know, we setting your prices just higher. You can You can apply global changes to a price. And you can randomly increase prices. You can change your labor rates, materials. I'm a big fan on building a price list that has a lot of structure to it. So not necessarily that you go in and, and you just make some, some quick modifications. Because if you change your unit pricing list 
and you don't change everything else in your business, uh, your rate materials to align with it, effectively what you're going to do is you're going to get something that doesn't feel feel right and it's hard to defend. Um, your price is your price. So you can always defend it with a contract. But, I mean, it's hard to implement into your business. I'm going to show you why. Uh, I take a different approach than some of the others in the industry uh, when it comes to pricing. I, I'm a big believer you set your own prices. I'm a big believer you need to know what your costs are. And so you effectively are building out a margin based on volumes and a whole bunch of stuff. But there has to be more strategy to it so that you know where your negotiation zone is. You know where you can't negotiate. Um, you need to have all that dialed in. But when we get into unit pricing, uh, I'm going to go through some of the basics and then dig down a little deeper and, and tell you what's what's going on inside some of these. All right. I got to minimize that and move us. There we go. I'm going to talk about it in generic form, but this applies to all unit systems. It applies whether you do a single unit price, you do a single material, you do a combination like exact main core logic where they combine equipment and materials and, and different pieces to that. Um, if you if you put multiple unit estimates together and you combine to create a components group or or an estimating group, you might do extract, carpet, uh, remove pad as a group of, of line items and you just say, you know what, $6 for that. And and I'll, t I'll we'll go through the, the risks of that when you do it. In here, when we look at unit pricing, you look at unit prices as a singular unit. So the easiest thing that we can do is look at a commodity, something that we add no value to, uh, something that doesn't change, buying a piece of material. So this was Home Depot pricing the other day, uh, two by four by eight, is $3.35, and this was in Washington State. Uh, funny enough, if you went to Jacksonville, Florida, there's it's one cent more to transport that wood all the way across uh, the U.S., so it's $3.36 in Jacksonville. What we're looking at here, though, is you've got a commodity. There's no value added to the lumber. You can buy it at any store. If you buy it from this store, it's $3.35 for that 2 by 4 by 8 When we break it down, we break the materials down. And so almost every unit price is by the foot, either square foot or linear foot. So you have to make some assumptions. If you're doing a square foot where you're framing a wall, you're saying this wall is being framed with a 16 inch on center. And for every square foot, we can do the math and figure out how much material is going to be uh, used in that, in that wall. We could also say that this is an eight foot wall and we're going to charge a linear foot, knowing that every 16 inches we have so much material there. The pricing mechanics of how you build that price out has to be known to, to your estimator. Because if you're sitting here going, we're going to build uh, a 2 by 4 wall and it's going to be 16 feet high, it could be different because you're going to have a different labor component. You might have a different material uh, rate component in there that's going to change how you look at the, uh, the pricing. In here, for this piece of material, it's $3.35 for an eight-foot piece. Uh, we're going to say it's 41.87 cents or 42 cents a foot uh, for every foot. We got a poll here. This is a question because we're dealing with a commodity. How much should a two by four by four, half the cost or half the uh, uh, length cost if a two by four by eight is $3.35? Uh, Krista, can you throw that poll up? There we go. So how much did a two by four by four cost? 33% because it's waste wood. It's just cut off off the, uh, uh, off the shop. Should it be, um, you know, 40% less because it's easier to ship 50% because it's a commodity. It's sold by the board foot. It's half the size. It's half the price. Uh, we got, you know, $2 and 18 uh, cents or yeah, $2 and 18 because it's special order. Uh, or $2.48, why not? It's 74% of the cost of a 2 by 8 When you look at it, the value of this wood, and, and we're getting different numbers right now. I'm seeing these come in. Um, yeah, throw your answers in, guys, where, where, where you think it's going to land. When you look at it, it's a 2 by 4 So at the mill, if I'm milling a 12-foot length and I get a 14-foot board, I might cut the 2 feet off because I need the 12-foot length. I need the longer, more... Um, billable lumber to go into the pile 
and then we've got these shorts. Maybe that's how they do it. Maybe they come in and they cut it. All right, here's the answers we got. We've got the uh, the poll stopped, and here's the answers. A lot of you thought it's just waste wood is 33%. Uh, it's easier to ship. So you got some people saying that it's smaller. Uh, it's 50%. It's less size. It should be half. And then a bunch of you said, hey, it's special order. We're going to put a little bit of a premium on there. Here's the interesting part about this is that when you go through this and you look at the lumber, they actually grab the material and they charge $2.48. That's 74% for 50% of the material cost. You have to think about this for a minute in what we do. So this is one commodity. It makes up one piece of one of your unit prices that includes nails and wood. But if you were to do something with a two by four by four, what's interesting about this is that the price skyrockets for the smaller job. Why? Now, in this case, I'm almost positive it comes down to shelf space and the cycles because you're dealing with retail. Retail is high on how many times does that inventory hit the space and, and what is that square footage of that space uh, generate? So there's a there's an overhead cost where there's, there's probably a very low churn on, on products. So they, they charge more to cover the overhead and they kind of know how much volume they're going to move. That's not a lot different from your business when you do equipment set, uh, rental. You're like, well, how much equipment am I going to buy? How much of the injected dries are going to go out on a weekly basis? How much of the air movers are going to go out? Oh, I got some specialty, you know, different heat drying systems that I bought. Those don't go out very often. I'm going to charge more for them when they do go out because it's different. And there's a there's a bigger overhead set, more days of overhead generating uh, um, on those rentals. You might look at it that way. Now, we went from 42 cents a board to 62 cents a board. And I'm sure that the only reason here is that when you cut smaller boards, they have to come from a straight tree. If you normally buy from Home Depot, they they cut all their wood from the crooked trees. The twist, these are straight boards. So Isaac's in the field cutting you super straight two foot, two foot or four foot boards, and, and they come guaranteed to be straight. Here's the other thing. What if you buy in bulk? If you buy these in bulk, you're now getting a better deal. And now it's 78% of the price. If you bought 100 of those, you're going to get a discount. When we start to look at pricing, even on unit pricing, there's a, a, a price factored in for bulk buy. You kind of have to look at that when you deal with insurance carriers and you sign a program. You are taking a discount for doing more of their work. How much of a discount in here? Here it's 5% for, for buying 100. Do you take a discount for doing some certain volumes? Well, we give the discount away before we get the volume usually. So usually you don't get the discount unless you give us the work. When we deal with insurance, we give the discount. We hope to get the work. So that's just how the industry has evolved. And so you don't have that volume discount unless you secure disc the actual volume. In our industry, sometimes we assume we're going to get the volume. And so we give the discount away and you don't get the volume in return. When we actually go and look at this, if you were to create a budget and you were to come in and say, okay, I'm going to budget for this uh for 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 buying eight foot boards and i need to come up with a budget i'm going to come up with a five dollar budget because i gotta figure out what my margins are if i want to build, buy that eight foot board if i do it this way i get 33 percent margin uh when i when i actually run my board and i buy the eight foot length if i go through and i buy it in bulk i'm getting a 37.6 percent margin which is absolutely huge because that's all bottom line dollars if we've already paid our costs on that that's going straight to the bottom line. We're, we're horsing dollars to the bottom line. The average business will run anywhere between 25 and 35, but anywhere as low as 20 and anywhere as high as 40. But normally it's like 25 to you know mid 30s, like 32, 33. That's your overheads for this type of business. So if all of a sudden you got 33 and your, your overheads on your business is, is 30, you have a 3% net profit. If you can find savings of four and a half percent, you double, you more than double your profit at the end of the year. So it's all about that bottom line. If we were to go in and buy our materials the other way, where we're buying the shorts, we'd only be covering a 0.8% margin. We'd be losing money. We'd be losing 29.2% 
of our of our margin because we have all these overheads we have to pay for. So for every dollar you do where you're not hitting those overheads, you're not generating 30%, if you only took overhead and profit, you're actually writing losses to your end of the year. And that's what we start to see is that companies are like, oh no, you take all of our work, profitable or not profitable, and at the end, it'll even out. Well, at the end, you might even out. If you were doing it the old school way is every job has to turn a profit. So when you start to look at budgets, just even on commodities, how you buy your materials will matter to how you make your money. When we break it down into unit pricing, if you don't know what your price is that you've, you're assuming your costs are, if you don't check that to come up with what is your actual price, you're sitting in here where you're losing money without even knowing it. And that's the problem with unit pricing built by somebody else. You don't really know what they did to build that price. Here's another example. Paint is a big one. Uh, this was Washington prices again. And so what we do is we look at the price per gallon and come up with, with what is our cost per gallon. So in here, I ran these numbers and the estimating unit price for uh, Xactimate this morning now, this was a Michigan price with a Washington uh, cost. So there might be a little difference, but with Home Depot, I think their prices are, are nationally pretty close. The estimating unit price was $48.99. That's how much Xactimate was paying out in the unit price. Um, if you were to, to have to get smaller quantities from the store, you'd be losing because you're paying $0.48 cents an ounce. You're then paying $0.75 cents an ounce. When you do it through a gallon, you're making six cents an ounce on that paint. So you're making some money, but not a ton. If we come down to here, um, and that's if I did my math right this morning, you're, you're making better money on the, on the five gallons, and you're kind of getting into that spot where that's where your margin should be. So here, you're, you're a little bit margin compressed, and over here, you're, you're in the good margins. How many of your jobs do you require a five-gallon pail? versus how many jobs do you need a gallon versus how many jobs are you buying a quart or just a touch up? Your pricing on your materials have to be reflective of what you're doing. And there's a whole bunch of factors that come in to pricing paint. That's bare uh, premium plus. That's the bottom barrel price grade. So we were able to go and take it and say, how do you do? Well, you're kind of making money at that price per gallon. You're almost losing money here. You're losing money here and you're losing money here. If you don't make these adjustments on your price, so to the question we had before is, well, I, I changed my yields, and, and yields is another term for production value, production rate, or consumption rate when we talk about material. If I don't change my material cost that I'm assuming I'm going to get a production rate out of, if I don't change my cost, I'm every time I put a, a dollar or a square foot of paint in, I lose money. So then there's a few things that can be offset is, is one, we could say that that can of paint doesn't paint as much. So it should do 200 square feet, but we change our system up. So we say, well, we only paint hundred square feet with that can so we can double the price per foot that we charge. It's kind of hard to see when I talk about it in theory like this, there's a whole bunch of explanations on how you break down your materials. Look at it this way. If I use the bare premium, paint primer uh, on the on the $30.98 gallon, I have a small margin that I'm, I'm pulling in there. If I move over to the stain blocker, my margins are getting compressed. If we go to marquee, we're almost like we're break even, we're losing a little bit of money. And then when we go to dynasty, we're giving $10 away a gallon. So like you're losing money and it's not $10. That's based on the assumptions that you're getting the full coverage. If all of a sudden your costs go up and your coverage comes down, you need to go buy more paint to cover that, that inefficiency. Do you know how many square feet a gallon is actually generating? And if you don't, how do you know if the unit price is right? And so there's a whole bunch of assumptions that we allow others to make for us. Whereas what you would do normally is you say, hey, this is a thousand square foot room and you would go paint it. And then you would come back as an estimator and say, well, how much paint did we actually use? Well, when we use Dynasty, we use you know, five gallons of Dynasty for a thousand square feet. When we use the bare premium, it actually was like seven gallons. So we get less coverage with the cheaper paint. We have to use more paint. Oh, okay, well, that's good to know. We don't do that in this business. We, we're very focused on churning volume. We don't spend a lot of time 
looking at how how are those line items being built. But if you did this as a as a drywaller or as a painter, because we're talking about paint, you would know your numbers because you'd be like Dynasty covers really good, and we can get a little bit more square footage than what we plan. Uh, the 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 bare premium plus is really watered down it actually covers less so we pay less for it but we have to use more you would start to learn that and you then understand where your costs are we don't do a lot of that in this industry when you look at material units we have the cost of the component inside there there's a whole bunch of things that you need to consider which is the consumption rate that's what some programs will call yield how much how much does a gallon of paint produce uh, and what's the consumption rate? So it, like a consumption rate for um, a gallon of paint might be 200 square feet per gallon. That would be the consumption rate. But if you're doing fresh drywall, maybe your consumption rate is 100 square feet per gallon because that prime and paint is getting absorbed into that wall. So it's not, it's like half as good if you're painting over other paint. Well, that's going to affect your, your, your installation numbers. Now you're hoping the estimating system is accounted for. We mostly paint fresh drywall. But if you're going into a new home and you're painting, you might find that your paint number is going to skyrocket. Your, your consumption number is going to skyrocket. You're going to need more gallons for a brand new build than you do for an existing home because that, that wall will not absorb the paint. So we look at consumption rate and say, well, what's our, what's our production rate uh, for the paint? We then look at consumption waste. So every time we pour a little into the tray and we, we don't empty the bucket out, we lose some waste. What is that per gallon? Normally you'll see things like five and 10%. But if you had a small job where you bought a gallon of paint and you're wasting half of it, well, your consumption rate is not 200 square feet. It's a hundred feet and you're pouring half the, the paint bucket out or you're leaving it behind. Did you charge for that? Most of the time when we get into small projects, we don't charge for that. And then it compounds you're not getting all the time for travel into that line item pricing. There's a whole bunch of compounding effects that will destroy your margin. Unit pricing is based on catching the fine tuning assumptions. In our industry, we assume that we, 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 one, we don't look at the details and then two, we assume they're right. What about project waste? Special orders, overruns and minimum orders. So how are you dealing with if you had to buy, uh, we had a job where we had to buy special um, crown molding. We had to order a minimum of 1,500 feet. We needed 100 feet of it. But we needed 1,500 feet of a crown molding so that they could run the production. We had to buy 1,500 feet of crown that we didn't need so we could put 100 feet of crown up. Now, if you said, well, out of that 100 feet, maybe we need an extra 10% for waste. So we needed 110 feet of crown and we've got a pallet of 1,500 feet of crown molding there. How do you do it? Well, you charge the entire shipment of that special order crown. And if you're working with an insurance company, maybe you're like, hey, we, let's see if we can sell it and get you some money back. But who's selling it? Us? Well, I got to charge you for my labor to sell that. Or you do, do, do you just want to buy the material off me? Project waste is, is key. That's where you're buying a gallon of paint. Well, if you bought a quart of paint, well, your price for that paint is now skyrocketed. You have to change your numbers. And if you're not adjusting your estimate and you're not going through, it's not just changing your price list. Every estimate is an art form of, of manipulating units to make it work. My price on my paint is now higher because I'm using less. Well, I'm buying five gallons. I can bring my price down. Um, I, it takes me more time to apply it in a busy uh, business it takes me less time to apply it when I'm working in brand new construction, but it uses more paint. All of that you have to factor in, which gets confusing. So unit pricing becomes one of the hard things to, to use in the real world, unless you know what you're doing, unless you have known environments where you're working. When we look at unit uh, labor units, there's six parts to it. There's direct wage, that's the hourly rate that you're paid to the worker. And and exact, uh, Xactimate and CoreLogic, they, they display that as worker wage. Then you have burdens, insurance, taxes, uh, other costs. So some of the other costs are things like phones, uniforms, um, commissions, you know, things like that. Inside those systems, they're, they're, they're not necessarily reflective of your job costs. Cell phones have changed over the years. 
Are you accounting for uniforms? Are you buying uniforms or renting uniforms? Two different costs when you do that. Are you are you putting your your people into premium vehicles and premium clothing, or are they getting you know disposable shirts? That's going to make a difference in how your business is operating. Do you have it laundered? Uh, are you doing laundry service, or do they launder their own clothes? You also have inside of there, you have things that you might want to do. Do you put the training budget into the unit, uh, the labor unit? What if this year you said, you know what, every staff member is getting five grand of training. Where does that go? Is that coming out of profit, or is that built into your hourly rate? Well, training, OSHA training, uh, workplace health and safety training. Technical training, that all needs to be budgeted. And in other businesses, it's budgeted inside of their hourly rate. In our business, has anyone accounted for that inside that hourly rate? So when you, you talk about just putting a blanket, let's increase our rates, I just saw a comment. So I'm going to just pick that 23% up. Okay. But why did you just throw that number in? And where is it coming from? So there's a whole methodology that unit pricing and pricing units is one aspect, but you have to look at your rate and materials. How is that impacted by that price change? And what are you doing over there? Uh, then you get overheads. So directly related to the trade. Now, what's weird about restoration is if you do restoration type of work in unit pricing, is there any assumptions that you're going to sub that out to another restorer? Probably not. And, and I, would, I would make the argument that I think the pricing reflects that they the people that built the pricing systems assume you as the restorer are going to do the work and there's no, you're not general contracting that out. So are your overheads reflective of what it costs to run a business where you're the direct labor? Do you have the trade profit? Are you getting trade profit in there? Or do they assume that your overhead and profit is enough to be your profit for the business? There's a whole bunch of things that unless you're building your own price list, which I like the people in the industry that are doing it, uh, but there's a methodology to building it so that you're actually cranking the right profit out of the, every line item. If you're not doing that or you're not in a system where you can do that, you have to then look at how are you going to work inside of a program rule where you can make the money. So do you have to charge for more line items? Well, now you get into a little bit of a, a gray area where you're charging for things that maybe you're not necessarily doing. At the end of it, you got contractor overhead and profit. And that's where the question came before break is, what do you do with the overhead and profit when someone says they don't pay it? Well, when you build your own price list, you move it in. It's either shown, so your customer says, hey, show me the overhead and profit. Okay, is it 20 and 20? Is it 10 and 10? And they're like, well, we don't pay 20 and 20. Okay, what would you like to see? Zero and zero, perfect. We move it into the labor rate. If they say, hey, show it to me like we're doing a cost plus job, here's my cost. And then you add 90%, like 45 and 45 on the job so that we get to a 50% margin. Remember, overhead and profit is a markup, not a margin. So you're already talking apples and oranges when we talk about adding 10 and 5 or 10 and 10. You, If you need 45% margin to run your business, you have to double those rates. Does that make sense? You can't do it on, on a... 10 and 10 add-on. That's not going to get you enough dollars. You're bleeding cash. Okay. When we look at this, this is why production rate, which is like consumption rate, and, and in some systems called yield, this is how you need to think about it. They're fake numbers. Unless you actually have done a labor study on that specific job where you wiped a wall to see how long it takes to clean, they're all vapor numbers. Your hourly rate and your production rate are vapor numbers. They don't actually apply to what you're doing. It just gets you close to an estimate of, I think this is what the price is gonna be. This is estimating units or unit estimating, where you say, to clean this wall, I think we're gonna be at that. If we had this, um, this example, let's say we have a plumber and we charge $120 for the plumber and that's our hourly rate and a certain production value that we expect to get out of them. We could say, that that's what we're getting based on the yield. What about a contents worker where the plumber gets 120 and the contents worker gets $60 an hour? It's like, well, hey, that's not very fair. Our contents workers are really well trained nowadays. The training has changed. They got upholstery and carpet cleaning and they know how to clean contents and they took the contents and processing floors. There's a whole bunch of training that we have to give our people. How does it impact your rate? Here's 
a scenario that's extreme, but I want you to think about it because this has actually happened and I watched a company do this. Um, when we look at unit pricing, we we say that a door takes an hour to install and maybe it's two people and it takes an hour and a half. So it's 45 minutes per person. You come up with a labor rate budget, you come up with a material cost, and then both of those combined gives you the price, including all the retail profit and all the 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 profit your business needs for overheads and your profit margin. One hundred and fifty dollars uh, is what's going to cover that for that that door. Maybe it's two hundred and fifty dollars. Maybe it's four hundred dollars. That unit price is X. Doesn't matter what it is. There's a certain amount of time that we assume we'll take to do the work. Here's the extreme example. You have a government that says you can only charge $25 an hour. And so you have now some choices you have to make. They say, you can only charge us $25 an hour. How are you going to do the job when your cost of your labor is $25 an hour? If you go back and you say, you know what? We charge $100 an hour and we just have to walk away. We can't do the work. That's one answer. You could tell them, yes, we'll do it for 25 and then invoice them at the end, 100, and then negotiate that you misunderstand the program. Or you could just say yes, and you could just say as long as we use unit pricing. And the reason why is unit pricing is a fake number. So if you want to see the hourly rate at, at 25, I can make that happen. If our production rate or our, our hourly rate and our production of that task is $200, install a toilet, hang a door. But if you said, hey, all you can do is charge $25 per hour, what I would do is I would come in and I would tell you that it takes eight hours to do now. So now I get to the $200 an hour, I just it just takes longer to get there. And so that unit rate is extended over time. Is that lying or is that falsifying anything? No, it just, I built a price that said, you want $25 an hour and in order to do the job, it's a $200 number. I have to charge you eight hours. That's how we get to $25 an hour, it takes eight hours. Unit pricing or unit, estimating is me estimating how to get to $200. It's not me estimating how much time it actually takes. It's me estimating to get to a number to actually do the job and meet all the margins. That's what it is. We use hours to calculate it because that helps us come up with budgets. When it's this extreme, throw it all at the table. It doesn't work. It does not work. But I can use it and be like, well, I need to get to $200. And so I'll just extend the hours out at that rate and that works. When you start to execute this way, you're being asked to charge a lower rate. It's it's in exchange for something. So you have to exchange it to get more hours because the price is always gonna be that. What happens if you brought a, a certified restorer and a triple master, somebody that's gonna like charge a ton of, of time. If I charge $500 an hour, but I'm like, I'm just going to charge you for exactly the amount of time it takes. And I go and do a job and it takes me 24 minutes. And I charge you that at the rate of $400 or $500 an hour. You're getting a bill for $200. That's what the value of the work is worth. It just doesn't take me as long to do it because I'm more experienced than somebody else. If you gave me a, a, a junior guy who's got a WRT, three days of, of training, and they've been on the business a week, games by 20 years, I'm going to be faster than them because I know more. So I'm going to charge more and I'm going to do it in less time. We get to the same invoice. And so what does it matter how I manipulate the numbers? Well, unit pricing, if you do it right, where you charge the right number and the right units, you can start to do budgeting. But this way, you can't really budget. So you get into these problems where how much are you charging? And then what the problem with unit pricing is, as you start to work through the mechanics, you get into the Goldilocks syndrome. People are going to come in here and say, well, what is it? It's too high, it's too low, or it's just right. The problem is, if it's too low, you're out of business. If it's too high, you might get paid, but you're not going to be in business very long because you're going to get blackballed and, you're, and your business life is going to be tough. It's easier to be just where you need to be, just right, and just above. That's your, your window of opportunity whenever you do estimating. Unit pricing... Is, is a fabricated number until it's not. So uh, I rent an air mover per day. That's a hard number. It's based on a per day rental. It's a piece of equipment for one cycle of 24 hours. 
that is a hard number and I will charge you for every 24 hours that you use. What happens if it's 24 hours in a minute? You're getting two days worth of billing. Ah, you charge me for an entire day when I only use 10 minutes or an hour or whatever. The unit price has been adjusted that you're paying $35 for 10 minutes of the next day. That's how unit pricing works. If you were to the minute, I would then say I charge you whatever it is, 35 cents, uh, 10 cents, 5 cents, 2 cents a minute for every minute that that equipment's on the site. If someone says I only pay you to the hour, okay, then I got to change my pricing scheme because my pricing scheme includes days where I get paid for 10 minutes and it includes days where I get paid for 23 hours and we average it out. So when we get into the unit pricing, it's not as easy as just blanketing your 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 price list up. It's not as as easy as just changing your labor rates. There's so many pieces that come into here that you have to think about how does this affect your your rate and material schedule? How is this going to affect your bids? And when you put all the systems together, you get into a really dynamic system where whatever you pull off the shelf is the right price. Here's the final thought. Unit pricing is a powerful estimating tool. It will save you a ton of time. Uh, you guys are, we got half of you guys that are estimators, the other half are owners, which probably also did estimating and project managers. Unit pricing saves you a ton of time in coming up with budgets and an understanding of what materials you're going to use when they're accurate. So it's a horrendous pricing tool. If you came in and said, I'm going to paint every house and every commercial building the same way, it breaks. Here's the example you would use. If you were a, a seasoned restorer and you were doing a restoration on the 40th floor of a building, you would know that there's parking constraints that you have to deal with. You have to deal with an elevator. Maybe it's dedicated to you, maybe not, most likely not. So you've got wait times, you've got ride times. You figure out the average ride time going up to the 40th floor. You come up with a price and you say, well, that's my price to do uh, painting in, in in this uh, specific building. You're not going to be able to be the residential guy who went to a house where you knock on the door, walk in the door, grab that price, walk into a high rise and be like, yep, yeah, same money. I'm going to go up 40 floors. You're going to lose your shirt. You have to factor in, hey, this elevator ride time not accounted for in that other price. Unit pricing is a horrendous pricing tool if you're not allowed to change it. It is not good. Why do you think insurance companies are now spending millions of dollars on review teams to try to get the pricing figured out? It's because they're using the wrong tools. You're using the wrong tool. If you want to get that figured out, you're going to put in people that have less experience reviewing estimates that aren't even real numbers. So then you get into a discussion about what is the real number, and that's how you get into trouble is they build these systems without knowing how to make them work. The reality is, they're great systems for estimating. They're a horrible pricing tool. That is the worst tool you can use as a unit pricing tool for pricing. Grabbing an off-the-shelf pricing tool, your 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 off-the-shelf pricing for something that you don't know is is rate material. So, we, how would you put? It? They're one of the best tools out there, and I like Exactware. CoreLogic's got a good system. It's it's I like I've, I've grown up around Exactware, so I'm 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 intimate with their their construction. I like their process. I like the tunability of it. The price list, you can't trust whether like it's not the right price list. It, it, it's not their fault. They can't build a price list that's right for you. It just it just can't happen. It just doesn't work. So you're going to use a modified tool. You're going to make it try to work. And more times than not, it will. But unless you build that system for your business, chances are that system is not going to work. Uh, hey, Kristen, I said we put a Q&A. We're into the uh, the next topic, so I'll just leave this screen up, and then if we got some questions here, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take a few of those. For sure. Did you want to go back to um, how do you explain the reviewer or to the reviewer that the yield rates are too low to complete the unit cost task? Yeah, so so it, this is, again, I hate doing these. This is, it depends. What part of the unit price are we going to discuss? So if it's that you're working in a high rise and the unit price doesn't apply to that because depending who you talk to, it's built on a 1500 square foot rancher or a 2000 square foot rancher. What's the assumption that the program was built on? Uh, I don't think it's been publicly disclosed where we don't say, Hey, this is what the program was based on. And so these are the conditions we based it on. 
you you have to go back and say, well, the production rates don't work. But part of it is 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 you have somebody who's learned that it's a it's a pricing tool, not an estimating tool. And so you're talking two different languages now. You're talking that's a a unit price that you're going to use, like a like an air mover. But it's not. It's a unit estimate, and we need to change the estimating piece of it to reflect the actual condition. So you could do a video where you show the time it takes to get up the elevator and be like, no, it's 18 minutes to, to go from the truck to the elevator, and that's not accounted for here. It's a tough discussion, and it depends on the context of how you're having it. The biggest thing is, is that when you get into a number that's like so far off, you might be better off to go back and say, I can't do it for the unit pricing for this building. I already know what's wrong. I'm going to give you a bid number for it because I can account for all the stuff that I need to do, and I'll give you a scope in the unit price. But there's some times when, when that price list and your job will never even be remotely close that you can't make it work. There's a whole bunch of uh, circumstances like that that you need to pick a different system. And if you've only been told that your unit pricing is the way and you can't modify it, you can't do the job that way. It's just, it's it's impossible. It's not a pricing tool. Good a good question. I I wish I could go deeper into it. It, it requires a little bit more context in, into the question and it, it requires more context in the answer. Um, I've dealt with adjusters that flat out wouldn't pay for work that was needed and performed. At what point do you bring this to the customer's attention? And at what point do you get an attorney involved? Oh, good question. You're a contractor. So here's the hard part. As a contractor, mm, oh, so, th so there's a couple of circumstances here. I'm assuming you're an independent. So, so let's make this assumption. You're an independent contractor who signed the, con the customer up. And now the insurance company is not agreeing to your scope of work. They're, they're saying, well, we, we don't agree that you have to perform that work. There's a whole bunch of unknowns there. Is it restoration work? Can we refer to a standard? Is it building code work? In the, and we can refer to building codes or is it in between where it's cosmetic and it's a, it's a feeling? At the end of the day, I am a contractor, so I will bulldoze your house if you, I just need to know who's paying. If you provide a scope of work where the insurance company says it's it's five grand and you say it's 10 grand, ultimately, if you start the job off, involve the customer, tell them, hey, this is what, walk the customer through it, have a site meeting where everyone walks through, but they don't show up, the adjuster doesn't show up. You walk the homeowner through and say, this is why this price is this and why we're doing this and why we're doing this. Your insurance company's paying for this. That's their argument. That's their contract. And here's what we got to get away from. And it's hard. There's empathy and sympathy. Empathy is that you understand that they bought shit insurance and that they spent no money on the premium, so therefore they get no coverage when they have a loss. Sympathy is when you take on that burden of them making a bad decision and you own it yourself. Uh, where you might be talking about, the problem with that is if someone buys cheap insurance and their insurance company jerks them around because the coverage isn't very good, that doesn't mean that you need to go and own the emotional uh, burden of it. It's like, hey, you save money at the premium side, so now you have to pay out of pocket. That's kind of like going to the dentist and them telling you that you're only covered for 80% of the dental procedure or 50 or whatever. It's the same thing. Uh, for me to do the job right, it's this. If you want me to deviate, write a change order uh, and I'll, I'll do it for you. The problem is there's a whole bunch of what ifs in that question. And so I'm, you know, as a general rule, you might be talking about is it tortoise interference or is it um, some kind of a law where they're interfering with your contract? That's a little tough to prove because you both have contracts with the customer. So it becomes the insurance company protecting their number, which they're free to do. Um, they're free to interpret their policy however they want. It's the homeowner's right to go and argue that. You as the contractor, you don't have a, a, a dog in that fight. Your deal is get the job paid for insurance is given the homeowner half the cash the the part we get confused on is it's like well they owe us for our work no they don't they don't have a contract with you they don't owe you shit they owe the homeowner to indemnify them for the cost as per the words of the contract that has nothing to do with you and that's the insurance contract not your contract 
if the homeowner wants to pay you extra, great. If the homeowner doesn't, and, and you can you can test this on like a roof. If they have actual cash value on a roof where it's 50% coverage, let's say they depreciate the roof and they say, whenever there's a, a covered loss, we only pay 50% of the roof. In that case, if the roof is damaged and is $20,000, they're paying 10. If you come in at $25,000, well, maybe they'll pay 12 and a half. But they're only responsible for part of that value. The homeowner is responsible for the difference. Don't make it your problem. You're there. You might walk away from those jobs. You're going to burn up a lot. Like Facebook is full of, hey, the insurance company is screwing with my customer. Well, go find a new customer. You're not always going to be able to win. And why would you take on all that legal expense? Now you're going to have to build that into the cost of your labor hour. Maybe just go find easier work. It's not the best answer. But it is a real answer that maybe you need more leads so you can cherry pick the work you get. Sorry, that's a long answer that maybe doesn't hit all the points that you're looking for, but it's uh, it's tough. It is, it's not that it's easy. It's just it's a perspective change. So when you're looking at specific material pricing, are you taking into account delivery of materials or picking up the materials? Yeah, great question. If you look at the unit pricing assumptions, there's not very much time for it. Um, at one point, it was 30 minutes. Sorry, at one point, it was 60 minutes of time. I'm talking about the, the blue system. And then it was 30 minutes and then went back to 60, which is great. But if you're doing two hours worth of work, you're not getting 30 minutes of travel time. You're getting four or six, right? You're getting like a fraction of the travel time for the day because it assumes your whole day is eight hours and assumes 30 minutes for travel. Well, if you have to go to the store and pick up an hour of materials, you have to charge that in as extra. Your unit pricing has to reflect that. So on larger jobs, it evens out over time. On smaller jobs, you might say, hey, I'm going to make a phone call and, and get delivery done. It doesn't include project management time. And so you have to read the assumptions of what's included, what's not. Project management time is not included. The project manager makes the phone call and says, deliver it. That time would typically be billed to a file. How do we know that? Well, when we do a rate material invoice, we charge for project management time, administration time. And so any time used and accrued on that job, we bill for. When we get to unit pricing, someone came in and said, hey, this is part of the hourly rates. And they make up rules based on the price. That's why you need to understand unit pricing because the basis for it is rate and material. If you don't have rate and material tied to your unit pricing, you got two different systems that don't even speak the same language. Um, so when we use exact analysis for paint, we separate the line items, paint lab install, and then paint material to match retail pricing. Would you do this differently? Depends. Um, if you're in a program and you're like, hey, I got to show it and you, and you want to get reimbursed for that Benjamin Moore paint, the expensive stuff. Yeah, that, that, you're, you're, you're no longer subsidizing the job. You're getting cost recovery. Do you have enough in that material that you're getting your profit margins met? So remember, we talked about consumption rate and waste. If you increase, if you decrease your consumption rate and you increase your waste, you can get paid more for the paint. So you can, you say you use a gallon, sorry, you say you use two gallons of paint, but you only really buy one gallon of paint, you make 50% profit because you get paid for two gallons of paint when you use unit estimating. If you change it, if not, you say, hey, I'm not getting paid for that extra paint. I just want to get paid my costs on this so that that $45 can of paint that we pay $80 for isn't costing me $35. That's a good decision in a model where you have rules and restrictions on you. I, I like that. But if I'm in a if I'm in a free environment where I'm setting my price, then my price is if I pay fifty dollars for that paint and I need to make fifty percent, that paint is now a hundred. And so it depends on how what environment you're playing uh, restoration in. But I like that if I'm in a program and I don't want to paint, subsidize or painting cost out of my profit, I'll be like, just give me cost recovery. That's a good solution in some, some cases. Yeah. yeah. That's a good question. Let's go one more and then uh, uh, just so we make sure we're good for time. Perfect. So last question, does the adjuster have the right to determine your percent on the overhead and profit? Meaning can they decide if they pay or not 
the uh, OMP? If you have a contract signed with them, then the an the short answer is if you have a contract signed, it's what the contract says. Otherwise, you're a free business operating in a free environment. Now, the problem is, how did you build your estimating system up to include the pieces that you're bringing in? So it's it's under normal circumstances, no, in a TPA program or a, a preferred program, maybe. And that's probably your your short answer. But under under like where you're you're an independent contractor working with the independent uh, homeowner, no, no, they can't dictate. Uh, they try, but but it's not. It's not for them to tell you how to price your jobs. That's for you to come up with a pricing scheme. So tools of the trade, there's a lot of discussion that comes up is that your tools of your trade are included as part of your hourly rates. And the problem with this is tools of the trade for some trades like carpenters could be hammer, tape measure, pencil, square, saws, uh, and your tool belt. It doesn't have to be, but it could be that. Uh, if we were talking about, you know, What's common? Well, what about saws, like table saws? Is that part of the tools of the trade? They use them. Should it be billed out separately? It kind of comes down to how do you build your price? And I keep coming back to this because we don't think about that in this industry, but you think about it if you're an independent trade doing rental work. Does a homeowner want to see that you charge them every day for saw rental? No. So you build it into your hourly rate. If it's built into your hourly rate, then whenever you use your saw, you've accounted for it that you charge for every hour of work, even if you're just using a pencil and a square, you're still charging them for that, that saw rental because you built it in a certain number of hours a day, you're going to be on the saws. And then you have to replace the saw, you have to repair the saw, saws get stolen. You have all that accounted for in that hourly rate. If you don't account for it, it comes out of your profit. So when we talk about tools of the trade, there are included as part of the hourly rates if you're using an off-the-shelf estimating system. We we absolutely include them. But here's here's a different perspective. Here's what you can think about. And I like using this scenario because it's it's our partners on the other side. Insurance policies have tools of the trade. They assure your house, the uh, uh, you have building, you have additional living expenses. Some of these policies will say, we cover jewelry. And let's say that all policies say we cover some portion of jewelry. Well, is it $10,000 of jewelry is $100,000 of jewelry. A policy has a tool of the trade. Well, we have liability. We have coverages for special types of, uh, of, of, of things that you own, contents that you own. But how much do we cover? Well, that's, that's how we come up with our own policy. So one company might have zero to $10,000 limit. And another company says, no, no, we're good up to $100,000 before it has to be scheduled. You're like, wow, this is crazy. It's a pricing scheme. They come up with it on their own. They price it to the market and they try to lure in customers. Um, there's a really cool, there's a really cool policy. I'm going to show you this one. Uh, I came across it a few weeks ago. I was in a debate with somebody and, and it came up with this. Insurance policies that cover contents. Would you expect that there's a hole in one policy inside the homeowner's policy? If the policy covers contents at your principal residence, we will pay up to $500 for expenses you or your family member incur to purchase food or drink at a uh, golf club to celebrate a hole-in-one achieved by you or a family member during the official round. The scorecard and the certification from the club or match secretary must be submitted. No excess applies to the cover. This is crazy. So inside a, a normal insurance policy, well, a higher-end insurance policy, someone put a hole-in-one that if you sink a hole in one, you're going to get $500 and we're going to pay up to $500 of your food and drink bill. So if you have a $1,000 bill, we're giving you 500 bucks. If you have a $350 bill, we're giving you up to $500 for those expenses. We'll give you $350. This is insane, but it, they created their own tools of the trade. And they said, this is what's in covered. This is what's covered in that insurance policy. When you pay that premium, that hourly rate, this is also in covered in there. Could you imagine being a fisherman and they're like, hey, we're going to sell policies to fishermen because we think they're a good customer base. If you catch a state record uh, in your home state, we're going to pay for the mounting of your fish. And that was your insurance policy. You'd be like, that's a cool policy. I would probably do business with that company because they believe what I believe. So tools of the trade is about how you build your price and what you have factored into the hourly rate and what you have left out. 
Uh, that was a Chubb homeowner policy uh, out of Australia. It was kind of cool to read. They also have these. What is the tool of the trade in insurance? What's liability or, 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 or coverage? They're only going to cover up. They pay $500 for a hole in one, but they only give you up to $2,000 for cash that you lose in a named peril or a, a peril at the house. Uh, if you have watercraft spare parts, they'll give you up to five grand for spare parts. But you get $500 for something that has nothing to do with insurance. So their tools of their trade is that they put stuff in that they accounted for. And they were like, hey, we want golfers, and that's who the high-end people are, are focused on. If we grab another insurance policy, they also include uh, watercraft parts, but they only include $500, $1,000, or $2,000. If you were a customer, you said, well, no, 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 no. $5,000 is covered in all of your policies because the other guys cover it. That's not how it works. This company built their policy based on these assumptions, and that's the rate you pay. And the other company said, no, we'll cover you up to $5,000. Why? Their boats are probably a little bit bigger. So therefore, the prop is probably $4,500, where these boats are a little smaller. Props may be $450. All it is is a pricing scheme. And if you're not in control of it, you're getting it swayed back and forth. You're getting it pushed and pulled. And so people are telling you what is and isn't covered. It's no different than insurance policies. They tell you what they're covering. You read another one, and it's completely different. You judge the premiums and decide which policy you want. Now, that's a peace of mind contract, but it's just something for you to, to look at. You are in the same business. Do you charge for your FLIR camera or is it built into your hourly rate? Did you build it into the hour, hourly rate or did someone tell you that 20 years ago they considered that FLIR camera part of that hourly rate? Do you charge for ATP meters or just the tests? All of that can be built in. And when you build a rate and material price, you probably charge for that stuff. All of a sudden in unit pricing, it's all built in for you. Well, okay, how much are you, are you charging for that tool? Oh, it's not on the price list. Then you probably didn't impact it or it didn't put it into my price. Parts of an estimating system. So I, I talked about this before. And it's not necessarily the formal contract. It's how you frame your paperwork and then you take it to your lawyer. So you have your client contract. This outlines all the rules that you're going to follow and you're going to make sure that it it, it meets the needs of the insurance industry and what you're trying to do. Your contract is your rule set. It says that you need to pay me in 15 days. Well, you know, Gary might have a, a contract that says that you pay him in 60 days. That's just the rules of the contract. Well, he charges more per hour so that you can pay him later, whereas I charge you in 15 days and then I charge you interest until you pay. That's just how we're doing business. The contract is, is the rules of engagement with the client that we're going to do business with. To the question of if the adjuster doesn't pay, it says here in, in one of our rules of our engagement is if the adjuster doesn't pay for the uh, contract we're gonna or for, for the damages, we're going to charge you directly. We don't deal with your insurance company, but we will wait for them to give us a check and then you pay the difference. That's fine. That's a contract. That's what you need to have in place because that's the rules that you're going to have. Our overhead and profit is 20 and 20, 40 and 40, 50 and 50. What it, It's your contract. If someone signs, that you've made an agreement on that. The insurance company has the right to say, hey, we have rules in our contract that we might not pay that. That doesn't mean that you can't charge the customer that. It's a, it's a really weird environment. It's different than if we were doing renovations and you said, yes, I, I would like this kitchen. You buy the cabinets for 20 grand, but you charge the customer $50,000 for the cabinets. It's no different. You added value to it. You told them the price, they accepted it. When you throw an adjuster in, it changes your contracts a little bit because the homeowner might not get reimbursed for it. One of the big things is, do you are you telling the story? So floor plan and sketches, even if you're doing rate and material jobs, this is something you need to have. You need to have a floor plan of what you're dealing with. That's going to help predict how where your, your cutoff points are, where your containment barriers are, where your site protection is. That's giving somebody who's not on site, who's who's back in an office, an understanding of why you did what you did. Which room were you working in? Oh, I was working in the living room. Oh, okay, that's a big room. Why is that? So, there's so site, uh, so much site protection because it's a big room. Oh, you're working in this bathroom. Okay, well that's why you had to protect all the hallways. A floor plan is huge. Um, it saves time if you're using unit pricing. If you're using exact. And Circle has floor plan where you take it with your camera. You save a ton of time 
doing it. It used to be an art. Like you, as estimators, we used to pride ourselves on how good our sketches were. You can rip 3,000 feet in six minutes now, and three hours later, it's in your estimating system ready for you to tune it up. There's no point in doing it uh, anymore. You got huge accuracy, 98, 99% accuracy. It makes sense to do that. Now you focus on scope. Scope is where you make and lose money. Estimating, as long as your measurements are right, you're you're gonna you're gonna be able to put it in the system. If you're using rate and material, you need a very good floor plan to be able to discuss it. So the one on the left is the floor plan and circle gives you. If you were doing a uh, a rate and material job, you would be putting it into that, and that's what you would submit. If you were doing it, you would get this. If you're doing unit pricing, you would get the one on the left, and then you would convert it to the one on the right. And then you would tune the doors up. That's not in a circle issue. That's an exact where integration issue. The bread and butter is your scope. Where, what, when, who, why, how, how are you doing the work? So this gets to the question about what, what if the adjuster disagrees with the scope? Well, have we done a really good job of articulating why we do it? Do we have legal requirements, the law? Do we have uh, uh, standards requirements? What's the order of operation? Hey, we're detaching the toilet on Monday. We're resetting it four months from now. There's going to be two minimum plumbing charges on that job. Well, we don't pay many minimum plumbing charges. Cool. Pay the plumbing invoice then. You can negotiate that through, but the scope of work is going to dictate the price. So if you start to get into that detailed scope of work and you make the adjustments on your unit estimating and submit it in before, it becomes a bid. If you do it after, you're left to negotiate with somebody who says, I don't think you needed to do that and do this. Again, that gets into like the communication of your scope. Documenting it is where you are gonna need to be if you're trying to justify it before, you absolutely need to do this. And so as an expert witness, I don't, most of you may not realize, I do a bunch of expert witness work where I work with lawyers, either in the appraisal and, and umpiring uh, arena, or as an expert witness in legal. When you document, you're looking for a chronological uh, story to be told to justify all the decisions you made. You might do something wrong, but based on the information you had at that moment in time, it was the right decision. It later turned out to be wrong and you had to correct a bunch of things. That is something that can get you out of trouble if you're doing a file that goes legal. Or, and I say legal, it might not be that you go to court. You might be in a deposition or you might be uh, just in a in a, a arbitration or mediation, you might just be dealing with a claims manager up the the ranks. You might just be dealing with a reviewer or the adjuster. Somewhere along there, you're in a conflict resolution pro uh, process. Documentation is key. Your schedule is key. So, are you talking to an adjuster who says, "I don't think I need to pay you for that," but you show them, "Hey, toilets coming out here, toilets going back out over here." There's that's two charges. Because in their mind, they see a line item. They see detach and reset. It's a line item. It's $150 or whatever it is. That's a line item. You're like, no, 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 no. It's two different times on our schedule. And by the way, we've got two other plumbing times that we have to put them in, in, in out of order. So you're going to get four plumbing minimum charges because that's the, the nature of this project. When you show it on a schedule, it helps allow somebody to comprehend why you're doing what you do. The last thing you get into is you, you build a budget or a ROM. And you build the total severity into the ROM. Whenever you tell, and ROM is a rough order of magnitude. So when you tell a customer, I think this job is about $15,000. In your mind, you should have a budget. How much is this going to cost you? Five grand, six grand. If your budget is 12, 13,000 and your ROM is 15, you're probably not taking the job or you shouldn't take the job. You're looking at what is your budget? How much do you expect the cost to be? If you're doing a unit pricing estimate and you don't know what your cost is before you submit the number, how are you knowing that that's a good number? Like it's, it's insane. When the year that you saw us lose money and I, I gave my people that false knowledge base, um, that false confidence, they were submitting numbers cause it came out of the system and they thought they were good. We were losing money hand over fist. Every, every job we were taking a lottery win or a loss depending on how they wrote. Most of the time, they wrote wrong. So when you look at anything that you submit, what's your budget? What are you expecting for cost? If you don't know that using unit pricing, that's one of your biggest problems. If you don't understand how to come up with a budget for that unit price, you are literally just gambling on everyone, and you don't even know how, how you're playing the game because you don't have the cost associated with what you think that's going to cost you. 
it's it's not hard. It just takes a little bit of time and training to figure that out. But you need to know that. The next section we get to is documentation to win. So when I review disputes and you see people battling over dollars, almost all of it's around the failure to communicate and the failure to document. I had one client where they they brought me in and they said, hey, can you review our file? We think we've got a winner here. Like a bunch of things went wrong on the job. And I reviewed their file. And this was the email that I found. It was like, hey, Jerry, I'm concerned about the foul odor and the flooring in the basement not being suitable for my family to live around. What is your plan to deal with it and so we can be safe? Now, the project manager was driving, pulled over, made a phone call, and, and in, in his mind, solve the situation. Hey, we're going to go and carpet clean it. We're going to deal with it. Uh, it's an old carpet. And a whole bunch of things that happened was that they didn't write down any of this conversation. So on file, you have a, a, a an email with zero response, no notes in a file, no nothing. So you've got a, a health and safety concern and no ramp, uh, um, rectifying the problem. Later on in the file, you say, hey, Jerry, I see that the repairs are starting and the contractor mentioned that the floors are a concern and he's worried about our health. Can you address this issue? The project manager is like, Chris, this whole thing went sideways on me. He's like, we did address it. We said we would clean your carpet. He wanted to keep the carpet because he wanted a shorter time to get back in his home. Now, after everything's done, he's saying, hey, there's this odor and this other contractor saying maybe you should worry about your health because of the odor. And he's like, he made the decision. I'm like, well, your paperwork doesn't show it. You didn't document the conditions. You didn't document the odor. You didn't do anything. You had conversations. You were running the job, but you have nothing to support you. You're going to have to settle this one out. You're going to have to eat the bullet. You have no defense. Documentation is key. And here's how you document. If you want to eliminate 85, 95% of the battle, just do this. Show up to the job and do a, a site safety assessment. Is there any risk that we need to be cautious of? 360 photos left to right, eye level. If you, there's something in the ceiling, do a, a lap around the ceiling. If there's anything on the floor, do the lap on the floor. This is the building when you found it, the exact way you found it. You do not bring your tools in. You do not put a toolbox in the kitchen. You walk in and you leave everything in your truck. Then you go and you observe when did it happen? Where did it happen? Why did it happen? And you inspect and you do every room that is related or unrelated, but you're going to be working in or walking through. Then you can do a video, a video of, of everything that you need to do. Videos are great when you have odors and then you document the cause of loss and, and source of loss. Now, cause of loss is what the insurance companies determine if they're paying. Source of loss is you're determining how you're going to handle that, that event. Can you document pre-existing damages? Why? Mrs. Jones doesn't realize her baseboards are dented. Her walls have dents from the kids because when you walk by it year after year, you ignore the dents, things, and scratches. When you get a freshly painted wall and you put it against a worn wall, you find every dent, ding, and scratch. So you document this. Again, don't bring any of your stuff in. You have a process, which is I document the overview, and then I document the dents, ding, and scratches, and all the damage. If there's odors, take a video. Hey, this smells like a wet sock. Hey, this smells like a wet dog. Uh, great to do that. Now you've documented. Now you come in, and before you get started, you put up site protection. I'm going to protect the floors. I'm protecting the walls. And you take pictures of that. From the entrance to the exit, you're going to protect those people's unaffected property. That's your job. That's what you're doing. Because if you don't, you own the liability of tracking Category 2 or 3 water through their house and bringing it to the unaffected area. Cross-contamination, physical damage, you are paying to putting stuff in to get per, uh, paid for that. And then you put negative pressure. If it's a contaminated environment, you put negative pressure to don't let that contaminated air go through the house. That's your unaffected areas. If you do those three things, you eliminate most, if not all, of your unaffected legal liability damage. There's almost nothing you're gonna be held responsible for that you didn't do anything that you did do, you might have to pay. Most often you don't. When you get to your affected areas, you have your initial inspection, your cause of loss and your source of loss. You're gonna run through this and you're gonna check the, uh, you're gonna go through this and you're gonna look for site uh, resulting damage. 
structure, contents. What are you doing? What is the escape of water? Where did it go to? Did it damage this wall? Is it on the other side? A lot of technicians will not go on the other side and scope that other side of the job. Do we have water that migrated under the sill plate but just got wet on the other side? That room now becomes an affected room. That's going to change dehumidifier calculations. It's going to change your scope of work. You're going to need to expand your work area. You're reducing risk. What about contents? Is there contents that we need to document that have high value? Do, do we need special handling? Is it a pool table, a piano? Do we need to get a crew in? You have to figure that out and document it. Equipment's another one, and this is where you get into programs versus non-programs. Placement is optional, but you're going to have programs that say, hey, we, respect, we expect photos of every piece of equipment. Uh, a lot of disputes happen between a program carrier and a non-program contractor. Like they don't have photos of, of, of equipment. Not required. Not required. It's, it's, a, it's a courtesy. If they choose to do it, great. If it's part of their normal overview photos, great. If they have a log sheet, that's what most of us do. Uh, if you have nothing, a little tough to justify your invoice. That justification is, is it easy to justify and does the standard support you? If it does, it works really easy. And then you create these reports and you get them out right away because now you've memorialized that that's the loss that you've incurred. And almost at the beginning of the job, you've eliminated most of your legal liability that comes down at the end. Now, when you get into scope, are you writing a scope on day one or are you waiting till the last day and sending in an invoice? Whole bunch of processes on estimating and like really building good estimating systems. That has to take place at from the moment you get in to the time you get the prelim report out. You better have something in there that you're already saying the tempo and the expectations for the adjuster so you can come back to it later saying, I told you the counter was going to crack the backsplash. I told you that was a risk. I told you the granite might crack. It's not my fault you can come back and, and justify that. As if you're here, Uncle Paul left the uh, floor plan machine on. Uh, you guys get five free floor plans for showing up to this event. And if you're an existing customer, use the one on the left, scan that code, uh, book a, a, a time with one of the, uh, the reps, they're going to get you five free uh, floor plans. If you're going to be a customer or you're interested in a circle, uh, get the one on the right. That'll get you a demo booked with the uh, with the teams. Here's the reason I think you should try this. I was skeptical of floor plan when we first were getting working on it. I didn't think a camera could work, and I tried a bunch of systems that had cameras. I was skeptical that it would be accurate enough to use for what we use. And you have to think, I laser measure everything. It, it turned out floor plan was really, really good, and it's improved it since we released it, or since Encircle released I'm no longer there. Um, Hard to say, it's, it's nine years of habit. But for you as an estimator, being able to go in and get all of that information and have it in your office in three hours, where it takes six minutes to do 3,000 square feet and you can have a labor to it, put that into your system. It'll save you time so you can focus on scope. Anyway, uh, those are the barcodes. Take a quick picture of them. If not, they'll be in the recording. Why do you want to be a profitable restorer? 20 years ago, I didn't know anything. Someone asked the question, how much experience I have? I had enough experience. I started as an adjuster, so I didn't know restoration. But my manager said that if you want to make money, you got to go be a contractor. So I left. Uh, but I didn't know anything. I didn't know what to do was the right thing to do. I didn't know where to start. I literally went and started working in the marketing department for a national uh, franchise. And I still was naive. I thought if I learned the, the technical knowledge, if I became a very technical restorer, uh, I could make a good living. I could, you know, adjusters would call me. They'd be trying to figure out, Chris, how do we do this? Because you're technically sound. It never happened. Um, I th saw people that had three days of training get more business than I could get for, for my teams. And so what was interesting is I thought I would have a, I thought credentials made, made you a better restorer that would get more work. It makes you a better restorer so you can have bigger earning opportunities. It's not necessarily going to translate that someone's going to give you more work because you have a credential. They assume that you are fully trained and ready to go. And so in the last five years, I had a little unique position where at Encircle, I got to, to see things from a higher level. So I'm outside the trenches. Uh, I get to see things from a higher level. And what happened was interesting. Those lawyers, adjusters, claims managers, property managers are all there 
and you think that they would recognize your credentials, they don't. They 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 don't care whether you're on your second course or your third course or your twentieth course or whatever. It doesn't really matter. They assume you're a professional restorer. If you have a truck and you have equipment, you're a professional. They look at you like plumbers and HVACs um, companies. Now, they might not put you on the same pedestal, but they look at you the same way. The fact that you're in business, they assume that you went through some rigorous uh, training and screening process like a plumber, like HVAC, to be able to get that truck and that equipment. And restorers have a, dif- a little bit distorted view of the role you serve. We're there, we're helpers. It's, it's just who we are. We're helpers, we're out there, we're helping people at their time of need, and the insurance carriers want to work with us. They do, but you're an expense to the file. You're not really a savior. You're, you're kind of a fraudster at times. We don't know how to, how to control costs, so we have, to, we have to put a bunch of people in front of you, and we have to try to catch the losses as they come through because restoration companies in, uh, effectively chew up the biggest part of the budget when you look at the expenses of claims. Similar to being an estimator, I thought they would respect my level three estimating certification. And literally they could care less. I have a guy that I was dealing with, had no certifications, he's self-trained and he's talking like he's a pro. And I'm like, hey, I'm level three, I proved myself. He could care less, I could care less. There's that conflict. What's interesting about that is nobody cares about your credentials. So I'm a professor at Humber uh, College. Uh, I instruct students in restoration. I teach the IICRC RIA courses. Um, you would think that people would be like, oh my God, we're amazed by your credentials. No one cares. And 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 you shouldn't either. It's it's a designation that you go get. It's a credential you go get. That's not where the worth is. And there's some good people. Anna from Encircle is uh, as a, uh, a, a an instructor there. No one's drooling over credentials. Here's what changed my mind. And I don't mean I don't mean to put down anybody's credentials. You should have them. Here's what changed my mind: is I got into a battle of opinion with an IICRC instructor over a legal file, and I I won't get into the details of the file, but I will tell you that there was technical things that needed to be discussed that the contractor did right that they were being told they did wrong, and the 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 basis of it was that the job was stabilized so the insurance company could make some decisions. And the contractor didn't start drying because they didn't want to incur any physical costs. They put some equipment in, stabilized the job, and they said, hey, that's as far as we're going until we know we're getting paid. In his report, the instructor put, every IICRC instructor in every course teaches the w- to, in WRT that the restorer must respond as quick as possible, and they must prevent the loss from getting worse. And I read this, and I had a flashback to 2007 because I remember the exact class the exact instructor and the exact whiteboard where he wrote, you got to respond quick. And when I was reading the report, it dawned on me that he was actually right. That's how we were taught. And I had to ask myself one question and I had to get up and go for a walk. What if everything we learned about restoration was wrong? What if, what if we learned restoration the wrong way? And here's the hypothesis behind my, my epiphany. The problem with the IICRC is that it's an ANSI certification. So that means the American National Institute uh, Standards Institute, uh, American National Standards Institute, and the IICRC is the Institute of Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification. That is a process to be able to get a standard published. The courses teach you what you need to learn to understand the standard, but they don't train you to be accountable to running the business. And so I thought this was kind of crazy because I'm like, well, the IICRC's curriculum is restricted. It doesn't teach you about oh s It doesn't teach you about how estimating and business practices play into doing a good restoration project. It doesn't teach you how the standard intertwines with it all. Sure, when you, when you look at it and you look at estimating as a whole, we learn unit pricing buttonology. When you learn restoration, you learn it coming into the industry as some technicals. You don't learn it as how does it impact a business. And then you're learning what you can and can't charge and you watch your margins drop. And so I started to run the perspective through is that, you know, we're we're starting a restoration job with the wrong priorities in place. We're rushing out to take care of somebody's needs, which is important, but we're not doing it 
in a systematic approach to generate the most profit for a company to deliver the most savings to the insurance company and to deliver the best service to the customer. So as we started to walk through that, I went, there's a whole bunch of academic theory that we put into the business that I didn't see it in circle. And, and we built hydro. So I designed hydro a few times, but uh, hydro, if you, if you're familiar with in circles, our wire damage program and, and I built it to be technically right. And then we built it to be, business right so you don't always do things in order you don't you have to apply some of this business concept and the interesting part is when it's done right in the field by an expert it's done really right the job goes really smooth if it, if you grab a novice and you put them in there it can go really smooth if they follow the steps so you have that flexibility that's how we that's how we learn restoration is we learn it fragmented but if you organize it you can actually become very efficient at delivering it and in 2016, I started to put all those pieces together when I came to Encircle, and, and it started to make a lot more sense. Um, when you drive buildings or you deal with fire losses, it just it just seems to straight line. So as we started to look at things, and I started looking at from a technical perspective, because we had troubles getting people to adopt water damage, even though everyone does it, people would be hesitant to move from pen and paper to digital process. And... The reason why is because every decision and every investment in the business should be about increasing profits, but it's not. We're trying to live up to some kind of academic, technical, right way of doing things. That's not going to turn a profit. So when I started looking at that, I was like, okay, my perspective changed. Would you buy seven dehumidifiers that are on sale that are imported from overseas, or do you buy four really high-end high performance machines. Well, you might buy seven because they rent out and you make more money on a, on a, a lower quality basis. But if I'm looking at, at the business, I'm like, I'm buying better quality machines because I'm going to try to figure out a pricing model that I can make more money and do, do better service for my customer. And it's interesting because you start to go through understanding how all this intertwines. And I realized that a lot of restorers bought into the technical, be technically savvy, and your business will come to you. We've had friends that have killed themselves because their businesses have absolutely gone the wrong way. I've had friends that got divorces because their businesses went the wrong way. And what we we understand is we can move quickly to get to the business needs met. Sorry, we move quickly to get the business needs met before we can restore the property faster. If we change the way we think, and we say we want to eliminate all that frustration in the business, we want to eliminate the resistance from adjusters and lots of it. You need to put the business needs up front and then the restoration needs are, they become what they are. We do it the opposite. We put the technicals up front and then we try to figure out how to fit the business into it. It's a perspective change. So I came up with that, why be a profitable restorer? And I'm going to answer this poll question. We don't have a poll, but the one before, I want to just run you through this. I want you to think this way about your business. And it's a little bit of a pivot change. You guys asked a bunch of good questions. I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions coming, but think about it as car assembly. I used the manufacturer as the example before. If I'm building a car and I build it in and, and I say my foundation for building cars is rate materials, I'm going to build a hundred cars or a thousand cars. And I'm going to see what it takes to build cars. Elon Musk probably went through this. He started building cars and he changed his processes and he thought about how he builds cars. And there's some videos where he talks about, you know, their batteries and why they did things. But if I said that it takes 80 to 100 hours to build a car and it takes $5,000 of materials to build a car, I know that my material range when I start is probably like four to 6,000 in material, probably four to 6,000 in labor. And then as I get experience, I learn that machines break down. I learn my inefficiencies. We do that in unit pricing is we, we learn certain assumptions to be either true or not true. But if I understand everything and I say, I'm going to build a car, I'll come up with a hundred hours, $5,000 labor budget, $5,000 material budget. And I can say, I can build that car based on building a thousand of them. My rate material uh, experience says it takes a hundred hours, which is worth five grand in labor, five grand in material. If I all of a sudden change the way I do things, and now I say, you know what? we got to really look at this system. Is there a way that we can hone this down? We could go into unit pricing and we could say we have 395 individual units that we that takes those processes take to build a car. 
And it still takes 100 hours. And it still costs five grand. And it still costs five grand materials. But because we know each, each process and the efficiency each process generates, we're able to go in and make predictions on time. And we can to- like hone up one or two processes and save some time. If the government changes safety regulations for our factory, it's either going to increase our time or decrease our time. So if we have more safety and it's slower, we're going to decrease time. If we get less safety and it's faster, we're going to be able to increase production and lower our costs. But we know that it, it's 100 hours to build the car. It, it's just the time it takes. It doesn't matter whether we go rate material or unit pricing. The cars come off the assembly line at the same speed. We can back track it into unit pricing. That's how unit pricing is actually built, is that you have a claimed experience through rate material, and then you come up with unit pricing. What happens if we have a experienced car builder and we tell them, let's say he's a plant manager and he understands building cars. He's done it for years, built thousands of cars of different sizes. He knows how much it costs to run the plant. He knows how much it costs to get materials. Kind of has an idea. When we do this process, it's this fast. When we do this process, it's that fast. If you said to him, hey, at the end of the day, what do you think this car is going to tell you or, or cost us? He's going to come back and say, you know what? I think it's just in grand. And then you'll be like, well, how did you come up with that? He's like, well, this is the processes that it takes to build the car. Can you imagine if we were to take a car that costs 10 grand in rate material, 10 grand in unit pricing, 10 grand as a bid? And he said, you know what? No, the price is all over. Uh, company A is 14 grand. Company B is four. That's what we're doing in our pricing. And that's why I say that the, the pricing models are, are clustered together. They're not even interwoven. When you look at other industries, other industries use all their systems together. Our industry says, I think we should pick one, and that's the champion. What it means is you picked one that's wrong. And if it's too low, you picked one that's wrong. And if it's too high, you picked one that's wrong. And you're trying to get to $10,000. Look at it from a fire loss. Could you imagine being an insurance company and you see these types of, of prices? You get company A at two fifty, company B doesn't know what they're doing. They're at sixty five thousand. They can't do the job. C hits the right number, but it looks bad because it looks like it's close to the bottom number. Quality control comes in and they're like, "Hey, you know what? I've I'm not building cars anymore, but I think it's seventy. And then you get into bid pricing, and so a bid price is the lowest bid wins, but you also need to go, what do we think it's actually going to cost? So if I looked and I saw 65000 and the, the job actually cost a hundred, well, I can't, I can't select the $65,000 bid. It loses. And so from a vendor perspective, you then start to look at things a little bit more like this, where things are, are in the green and in the red. Too high is no good. and Too low is no good. You can't be too much further than low, low, right? You can always be higher and be okay. So if we look at Building cars, $10,000 is what it costs to roll it off the line. If someone's bidding 14,000, 40% more, that that doesn't that doesn't fly. That's too much. If you're if you're looking at your unit pricing, it's 10 grand. 10 grand is the right number because time and materials or rate materials is 10 grand. If you're bidding, you might build in a fudge factory. You might say, hey, in the life of this bid, we figure robotics is gonna fail. When we go to restoration and it's a hundred grand for a rate and material. The unit price should be a hundred grand. It shouldn't be one thirty, and it shouldn't be sixty. It should be the exact same as what it takes to do rate material because it's based off the actual production value and consumption of your materials. So if you haven't learned that yet, or if you haven't learned that in your estimate models, all the twin tinkering you do with the pricing systems is is basically bastardizing your system even further out of sync. So I raise my unit price because something's off. That becomes a challenge your bids should look something like this now if you're bidding a job and you've got a bad homeowner could you bid 210 you could you probably lose you can always bid more and bids are are good because it gives the other side it gives the insurance company an opportunity to get more input in if your bid was 210 and the other bid is 65 the issue is is that the insurance company has to say ah no we know it can't be done for 65 they have to reject the bottom bid some adjusters you used to see this where experienced adjusters would be like, that's not even close. I was expecting 300 grand and I got 300, 325, 340, and 100. 
And so that's where you, you basically bounce off. All right, guys. If I was to look at one more thing, I look here where we got the uh, where we got our colors and we get into our, our our colors. If you're slightly high or slightly low, you're OK. If you're if you're too low or too high, you're out of the numbers. Um, I'm just going to take us back to a question that was asked in the previous uh, Q&A, which was, does the adjuster have the right to determine uh, percent on your overhead and profit? Because they have a follow up question, which was. Um, I was recently told by a long-term adjuster that what I'm submitting is not an estimate. They are invoices, therefore listing items or restoration processes that weren't done, such as using two gallons of paint when only one was purchased and used is fraud. Is this fraud? Mm, so that's a great question. Is it a unit price estimate or is it a unit price invoice? And so the adjuster is not technically wrong. You said... I'm going to charge you based on the units. And by doing it after the fact, it becomes, well, what was the actual scope? And so if I were to do unit pricing estimating before saying, I think I'll use twice as much paint, that's an estimate. I give it to you and say, that's the number I'm willing to do the job for. When you do it after, you technically are supposed to come back and tune it together. But then if you're going to do that, why are you using unit pricing? Right? Why are you unit estimating? You're giving unit invoicing. Well, you might as well just done rate and material. Rate and material isn't lined up with the unit pricing price list and efficiencies. So the two systems look like the cars. It comes back. It's a perfect question. It looks like the car's $21,000 or it looks like the car's $7,000. The prices are wrong. The production rates are wrong. So those numbers will never line up. And so the adjuster's not wrong in that sense but what they are also assuming is that the pricing from the pricing system is right which it's not so you would technically not be able to just grab the line items to put in but it would be uh where the adjust let, let's use a little easier scenario than paint um let's say that wood behind me i said detach and reset the wood but i didn't detach and reset it i put a scope of work in and said i was charging you for that work that i didn't do is it, is it part of your price? You may have a disclaimer on your estimate that says not all line items will represent a charge or the appropriate charge or the approximate charge uh, to that to that estimate. It's not wrong. It And that's why I, I look at it going just because you raise the rates on your estimates doesn't fix the problem from a fundamentals perspective, which then leads to how do you how do you make this complicated thing make sense? You can't. You, you just can't. So, yes, it's it's technically a unit pricing estimate or an invoice when you're done the work and you you send it off to a third party and they write a bunch of numbers for you and say 10 grand. That's technically a unit pricing invoice, which then you're going to go back and say, did you do that work? No. Well, you're now lying about it. It's because you're using a system that's broken. Yeah, there, there's there's. Unfortunately, there's a, a longer conversation around that because there's a way to set it up so that it's not that, but it's it's a long conversation. So, but there's there's some truth to that, absolutely. Um, so when settling a mitigation invoice with Fast Team, um, Erie third party for water mitigation review, I always run into an issue where I have to over explain things. For example, I use four air movers for a room. Their calculators call for three. So they try to knock our estimate down based on calculations. Also, they argue that OMP is not allowed in mitigation or emergency estimates invoicing. Sorry, slash invoicing. Yep. How would you go about um, addressing these items? Or have you ever ran into any of this sort of issue with third party? Yeah, so third party is what they're probably doing is applying it to a set of rules. So the rule set might, and 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 when you get around equipment, Equipment usage is even like IICRC calculations are technically useless the moment you turn on the equipment. But if you size it to three air movers and you put four in, and there's a reason why, they need that justification. You say, well, in the standard, it would call for this type of sizing, but because there's an offset or inset, here's why I use one more. Third party is trying to keep you within the lines of the coloring book. They're trying to allow you to color within the lines and get as much paint in that line as you can. The problem is sometimes it just it it, it just doesn't fit. And so it becomes one of these things. Do you charge 
for more days of rental for less equipment because that could happen. Uh, typically what we do is we charge less equipment for three days and then we should have had twice as much equipment in. And so your, your margins are upside down. All of that can come back and haunt you. But a third party is effectively looking at a program set of rules and saying, here's how we color in the lines to get check marks by the carrier. It's kind of gets back into that uh, learned behavior is that they just deal with yes, no all day long. And now they're saying to you, well, you can't do that in the field. You could if you're not in a program. So it probably comes down to program rules. Looks like we might have time for a couple more questions. Um, so when using Xactimate and you submit to insurance, is it an estimate or an invoice? The adjuster disagreed. I say estimate. Ah, is it is it before or after the work's done? Because if it's before, it's an estimate. If it's after, it's an invoice. The you're not giving an estimate on something you've already done. So the adjuster could technically be right is you didn't tell me how you, you maybe said I'm using unit pricing to price the job. Okay. Did you give me a rough scope of work? Did you give me a ROM? Did you say this is 10 to 12,000? We don't do that. Like there's a whole process that sets the job, sets the table. So that at the end you get the number you get. What happens is we come in and we say, we assume that the adjuster has a good understanding of how we do things in the field. They look at numbers. They may not pay attention to how you do it. Like they're maybe they're day one, maybe not. And then they're at the end, they're getting a piece of paper and it says, hey, I need the price of a car. If you haven't explained to them how they got to that price, they'll probably start in with a red pen and start cutting numbers. So if you didn't give an, in, an estimate up front, it's not an estimate at the end, it's an invoice. So the, the adjuster would be technically right, but it would depend on how you set the table when you started the job. It's a good question. It's a, it leads into, it's, it's like it's like playing chess, right? You're, you're setting the table for your, your next four moves. The adjuster from an experienced position is technically right. You never gave me a number to start. This is technically not an estimate. This is your invoice. And if you didn't do the work, why are you charging me for it? And it's because you're trying to get to that number. You're trying to get to the car example. You're trying to get to 10 grand. However, you get to 10 grand, the job is worth 10 grand. You're just using line items to do it, or you could use rate material to do it, or you could just put a bid in to do it. The price is 10 grand. That's what you're trying to do. You're using line items to get there. Sometimes we build our estimates, which is actually an invoice using line items and we don't know what the price should be. And that's where we get ourselves in the trouble. If that makes sense. It's not trying to be um, not, not trying to belittle it. It's just sometimes we don't know what the number is. So you have to have that value of like, what is this job worth before you start writing? C could we do uh, what, what, what's the thoughts on, on allowing people to leave and then just stick on for like another 15 minutes. Cause I, I think there's a few questions. Yeah, for sure. Um, we can do that. If anybody wants to drop off, we really appreciate your time. Um, we'll still be on here to answer a few more questions if you'd like to stay. Um, another question that was submitted is, why is there no uh, OMP allowed in mitigation with insurance? So it depends where you are. In Canada, it's standard that OMP is on all mitigation. Uh, some parts of the U.S., it's it's on uh, mitigation and then on independent contractors that are doing their own work, whether they're getting it through plumbers or other avenues, you, they'll put it on. So when someone tells you, you got to be careful. And this isn't just an OMP question, but when someone tells you that everyone else is not doing it, it's kind of like when I put my kid on the stair and I tell them that their sister doesn't get to stay up late, but she does. And she's got to go sit on the stair because it's her bedtime. It's kind of the same thing. You don't know what other people are doing. And and for the adjusters that were on here, sometimes like as a former adjuster, I'll be like, yeah, we sometimes allowed higher pricing from some contractors versus others. But in order to control the cost, you just be like, hey, we don't allow that. And it tries to tamp it down. It's just adjusters will say things that like O&P, O&P could be on there, or you could build it into your hourly rates and not have the discussion and say zero and zero. No different if you did a rebuild and you did all the pricing in line items, you got to the end of it, 
you added fifty thousand dollars to your your unit pricing, and you submitted as a single uh, single number bid, and said for this scope of work, this is the number I'm doing it for. It's just. It's pricing. It's like going to the store. Maybe one of the easiest ways to wrap our head around is because we're so wrapped up in, in how insurance operates, it's like going to buy a car or it's like going to Walmart and buying groceries at Walmart and they have bananas that are more money than if you weren't down to the, the discount store down the way. The bananas normally are cheaper there, but today they're more expensive. Well, you just decide to buy over there or you're like, overall, I'll just buy all of the all my goods here and I save enough money that it makes sense going there and, and, and ordering. How do they show the prices? If, if Walmart came in and put a delivery charge, like cars, when you buy a car, they put a delivery charge on, why don't you just build it into your price? Like, why is it a negotiating point? Maybe it's because they want you to focus on that to negotiate so that the rest of it, they don't have to negotiate. Maybe your OMP is your negotiation point and you've changed your prices so that you're not counting on getting it. There's a whole bunch of schemes that you can put together that allow you to get rid of some friction the pricing is complex this is like by far guys in our industry we've tapped this down as like this isn't a very complex thing when i was in university there was whole courses to around pricing schemes for different things like how do you price cars how do you price uh airfare airfare is like that supply and demand pricing do we have supply and demand pricing nope no we don't yet yeah, we have su su supply and demand needs in our business so some days our air movers could be $15 a, an, an air mover day. And then other days it could be $60 an air mover day. If we have no equipment, we don't do supply and demand pricing. So there's a whole bunch of things that the real world does that we don't. Doesn't mean it's right and doesn't mean it's wrong. It just it's different. And so you got to play, you got to come up with a pricing scheme that you think works. So um, this one is, with you being a former adjuster, would it be a good idea to send the insurance um, or adjuster a preliminary report of loss and ask them if they agree or disagree with the scope of work? Would this be something to justify their opinions on your final estimate after the work is completed? Yeah, you know what? Here, here's the thing. Whether you play program work, like if you spend any time on Facebook, you see the opinions come out. And I, I think they're, I appreciate the passion. I think they come from a bad place, but I like the question here. It's a common courtesy. The adjuster's job is to control costs and it's to understand the job. It sucks if you're the adjuster and you think that the job's going to be seven grand and, and an invoice hits your desk for 15. And you're like, how do I explain that to my manager? How does my manager explain it to his manager? If you call me and say, hey, Chris, you know what? This is a really complex job. There's there's cat urine everywhere, and, and we got to tear carpet out. Price is going to be X, and here's the the report. Um, why would you rather do the job and then get shafted at the end than to know you're getting shafted at the beginning and walk away from the job and, and cut your losses? If that adjuster had, and I, I don't know what the protocols are in their company, but if they can't work with you, why would you walk down that path to then not get them to work with you at the end? As an adjuster, it's like, hey, you gave me a chance to adjust. Now I can ask some questions. Now you can, you modify your work plan based on a common agreement. I think that's still the old way to do it. Insurance companies have changed the process, so it makes it harder. Sometimes it's all done through through exact analysis. But if you communicate better at the beginning, more times than not, you eliminate the friction at the end. And so that prelim report, 100% needs to go out. Instead of an email, phone calls are great because people don't read tone in there. If they had a really bad experience with a contractor before they read your email, they now read it with a tone you didn't intend. Uh, if you're not the best at typing email, maybe you wrote it with some tone because you had a rough day. Get on the phone and try to converse with them as much as possible. I know it's the world has changed, but yeah, I, I would 100% want to know what they're thinking before I do work and get too committed. I like that. That's that's 100% how I would handle it. Is there an argument that works for cleaning all contents in the affected area from a cat to water loss? Adjusters have been pushing back over the last six months and not approving any contents cleaning in these losses. Depends on the exposure. 
Cat 2 and Cat 3, the only difference between Cat 2 and Cat 3 is that we can save the, the carpet. And if drywall gets splashed water on, we can clean the drywall. If it's absorbed, it comes out. If you're looking at Category 2 contents, you've already said that the risk of the contaminant to health is elevated, but it's not to the point where we're worrying about death. Technically, the contents need to be moved out of there for you to be able to deal with the floor. Like you, you have to extract and clean the environment, remove flooring materials. The contents need to be packed out and moved. Do they need to be fully wiped down? It would depend on how long did the loss last? What are some of the other factors? Like, is there mold? Was there airflow across it? You know, in a general rule, if they weren't touched, maybe they don't need it like a detailed clean. Maybe they need a wipe down. Like it, it, it depends. Do they need to go off site and, and thoroughly get cleaned? Uh, if we're talking about wet contents, it's you're treating it like category three. If it's porous material, you're treating it like category three. Uh, if it was a sewer backup, if it's just contents that are in the air, you know, this cup was on a desk and it's in the environment. Maybe, maybe not. Um, what is the best way to handle an ingester not getting back to you ASAP for accomplishing sharing the scope? Yeah, so it depends if it's mitigation or rebuild. Uh, if you're looking at mitigation, you may stabilize the job and be like, I can't afford to put labor on here if I don't know if we're getting paid. So you stabilize and and protect the rest of the building from being contaminated. And <clears throat> you inform them that you're stabilizing the job until uh, you get an agreed scope that you can then execute on. There's nothing worse than cutting walls when they're like, you didn't need to cut walls. Now, having said that, the standard's going to probably protect you. If you understand how to use it, you're going to you're going to be able to defend yourself, but there is times when you're going to run into that where that scope is not being returned. Can you call the company and ask for a manager? Cause you need to get a decision. Like there's maybe you have the homeowner call and be like, Hey, you need to make a decision. It's your insurance company. So the homeowner ultimately has control over the property. It's their decision, whether you go ahead and do it, it's their risk. If they're going to get paid for that, for that service or not. But we, you know, that's that's the convoluted triangle that we run in is you're trying to work with the adjuster, but they don't technically have to work with you. They have to work with the homeowner. You're working with the homeowner, but you're trying to help keep everyone uh, working together. Sometimes adjusters just get swamped or they get a big loss and they got to go out. And so you're left to make decisions on your own and relationship matters. The uh, The homeowner is ultimately responsible for your invoice. If the adjuster doesn't get back to them, ask them if they sign for the authorization for you to go ahead and do the work. And then it's up to the homeowner and the insurance carrier to, to figure it out after. Um, but that's a financial risk to you, so you have to evaluate that. Yeah, that's an interesting one. It's always a little bit more complicated. So would you agree that Xactimate pricing data has not kept up with the current market labor rates? Depends. Uh, so has it kept up with, with market labor rates? I think it's pretty close. The problem with that is when you build a system that is based on knowing everybody's costs, you haven't factored in the margins required to run the business. So if my cost is $80 an hour on a drywaller, and the price list says it's $80 an, uh, an hour on the drywaller. Where's my margin? My margin isn't in there. Now, the way margin has to be added, two ways of adding it in unit pricing is you either change the labor rate to what your retail number is. That retail number is not a retail number. That retail number is your cost. And I think they do a good job of finding out costs because they talk to your suppliers and say, hey, how much do you charge to go do this? And then they put that number in the system where it's, it gets sideways, and this is any unit pricing, do they make the amount of time it takes to do the job longer so that that cost is then doubled? And that's where that one adjuster says, hey, this is a unit invoice, not a unit in estimate. 
it's a fabricated number anyway, unless you actually charge for the exact hours worked. So when you start to look at the unit pricing, they don't ask you how much they don't you don't get surveyed and say, hey, how much do you charge the customer for that labor? They ask, what is your cost on that labor? And then they put that in the system. Your margin is 10 and 5 or 10 and 10 overhead and profit. You can't make any money at that. So when they call a plumber and they say the plumbing is $120 an hour, that's our rate. That's why you see plumber rates at really high numbers. And then, but for you to make 40% on a plumber, you need to have that rate at $190 or $180. That's not the that's not the retail price. So the estimating system has flaws that have to be corrected if you want to actually use it as a proper estimating tool. Good question. That's that's the problem is, is you have all these fragmented pieces of information without a consistent plan on getting you to estimate, writing an estimate to invoice and people that are making some of these adjustments don't understand the market. That's the reality of it. So this is actually more of a water categorization question. So I think this is a good one. So touching back on the IICRC standards again, what is your opinion of if there ever a cat one after water has touched flooring, framing, drywall, garage floor, bathroom floor, et cetera, a lot of independent contractors never have a cat one loss. The standards say to consider all possible contaminants from the building makeup. Mm -hmm. That's not what it says. Hold on. That is, I happen to have a standard lane here. That is not what a category one is. So you have to look at the definition and there's one, and the reason I grabbed this is because there's one word in there that is, is very specific. Category one originates from a sanitary water source that does not pose substantial risk to dermal ingestion or inhalation exposure. So it doesn't say no risk, it says no substantial risk. And examples of category one water are, are you know, melting snow supply lines. Uh, category one can deteriorate two or two or three. Category one water that flows into uncontaminated building does not constitute an immediate change in category. So they forgot to read the second part, which says water that flows into an uncontaminated building does not constitute an immediate change in category. Now. What is contaminated? And the definition of contaminated, you would have to go and look at, but it's that it's, it's uh, I, well, let's do that because we're here. So contamination, let's see if we can define that quickly. A contamin uh, contamination, the presence of undesired substances, the identity, location, and qua qua uh, quantity of which are not reflective of an indoor environment and can produce adverse health effects, cause Damage to structure, systems, or contents. So it doesn't meet the definition. So if you said, hey, it hit drywall dust. Drywall dust is there, supposed to be there, and it's not adverse. It's not a contaminant. The contaminant would be a biological or, you know, if you had asbestos that fell. So the, the, the argument that, that there's no category ones, it's not, based on that is not a good argument. There's There's other ways you could come up with arguments like, what is the culture of the water, but that, you know, what grew, how long has it been there? The fact that water hit a floor surface, that's normal. Is it a risk? If water hit a contaminant like fecal matter, okay, that now is, is it might have been there, but that's now a category three. It's, it's, it, it meets the definition of a contaminant. And so it, it flowed into a contaminant. And so it's a little bit more nuanced than there is no category ones. I what I think is there's there's a small number of category ones. So so the number is not as big as we used to think it is. The category two is a really big number, and category three is a really narrow number because the category three is is runs the the, the risk of severe illness or death, um, something along those lines. But your your how much water do we actually deal with? It's that. We mostly deal with big category two category and maybe a smaller category one, but there is category one. So like, absolutely there is. So yeah, I, I, I just think it's, it's, you know, 
maybe they're on the FNG curve, right? Maybe they're on the little bit more ignorant side and, and just haven't gone through the standards enough. It, it's also a point it, is that when they come down, I just, from, from a, a perspective of would that water make you sick? We pour a lot of things and now, now a homeowner versus uh, there's, there's a whole argument around this. So I'm just going to leave it at, at it, it's, it's complex, but I it's, there's definitely category ones that are in a building. We'll leave it there for the say. Are you okay to take one more question? Absolutely. All right, let's do it. So when is the ideal time to bring up the customer that their insurance carrier will not cover, or sorry, will cover a certain amount of the total and they're responsible for the rest before signing the job or after signing the job? I, I have that at the beginning. If you go to a dentist, the dentist is actually an interesting, like, maybe, maybe it's different in the States. So I'm going to talk about the dentist in Canada. When you go to the dentist, they say, today, do you have insurance? And you say, yes, I have insurance. And they're like, okay, do you have your card? And you present your card and they know your coverage percentages. And they're like, well, you're covered for 80%. So that means that you know you're getting 20% of the bill, whatever that bill is. When you deal with a homeowner and their insurance, it's like, hey, do you have insurance? Yes. I don't know what's covered. So you're going to pay me the entire amount or we'll invoice you the entire amount and your insurance company is going to pay a portion of those, those, that amount of invoice and you're responsible for the difference. Now, homeowners are shocked, but when they're having a loss, the best time to talk money is when they need your help. The worst time to talk money is after they've gotten all your help and the house is dry and now you're like, oh, by the way, you owe me some money. If you lose the job at the beginning before you have any cost in the job, yes, you lost the job. Why would you risk your business losing like all that administrative time to chase dollars that you might not get paid? If the homeowner doesn't have the money, make a business decision before. And I know it's easier said than done. There's there's emotions that come into it. There's a whole bunch of like real business that happens, but you still have to make that decision at the beginning. So why don't you have the conversation at the beginning? Because if you don't, depending on your state or your province, you might have a really hard time collecting because you didn't disclose that they're responsible for some of that uninsured portion of the loss. It's, it's my, 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 my thought has changed. I used to be, I would try to sign every job and get it started and then try to have that conversation we had a lot of non-payable billables that we had to go and, and write off our books. Um, the companies that I see in the industry right now, the independents that are, are not doing program work, very, very rigid on their signing jobs up and accepting what kind of risks they want. So they would be, you know, if they have an insurance carrier that they know only pays half the loss, I'm having that conversation with that homeowner up front that, my experience with your insurance carrier is that they normally don't pay very much. Uh, did you want to, you know, here's our services and you, you sell them. Like you're not just saying, Hey, I don't want to do work with you. You're selling them that, Hey, if, if it comes in short, do you have a financing option? If it comes in short, would you like to make payments? If it comes in short, I want the work, but we're having a discussion about how we're getting paid before we do the work you're incurring costs and you're not sure if you're getting paid, that's a horrible position to be in. But there's a strategy, like apply a strategy to the business so that you can get paid. So maybe you give a, a, a maybe you're quoting the job. Like if you're doing a mitigation where you normally would do unit pricing, estimating after you're done the work, maybe you come in and go, ah, oh, man, my unit pricing sort of shows them like six grand. I'm going to just write an invoice or, or an estimate for seven thousand dollars with the contract, that if we get it, I, I've got seven grand signed in this contract. That's maybe an easier way to have the conversation with the adjuster after. Is hey, I have a contract; it's for seven grand. The homeowner is already committed to that. That's the price. Maybe that works with a unit price scope behind it. Um, it helps if the insured pays your bill. If that's not possible, there's just so much. It's, it's, it's building your workflow for signing the job up so that it leads to the highest percentage of you getting paid down the road. Having that conversation last is is not a good way to go. Well, some 
definite great information there. Um, we do want to thank everyone again for joining us. And again, thank you so much, Chris, for joining us. We really appreciate um, you sharing your knowledge. And thank you all again. Have a great day, guys.